Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome you to the second day of the conference. Uh, in this session, it's a privilege to be chairing this session. And in this session, we have a great lineup of speakers. We have Professor Nicola Muda from South Africa, and we have Dr. Tengo Ebeniza from EB EMB Health. Uh, the first speaker this morning is uh, Professor Nicola Muda. I'll just take some minutes to read out our biography. Uh, Professor Muda is the Computational Biology Division at the University of Cape Town and is a full member of the Institute of Infectious Disease and Molecular Medicine. She leads H3A BioNet, a large pan African bioinformatics network of 28 institutions in 17 countries, which aims to develop bioinformatic capacity to enable genomic data analysis on the continent. H3A BioNet has developed an extensive training program for African researchers. She also co-leads Sickle Cell Disease Data Coordinated Center and a Welcome Trust Center Data Integration Platform at UCT. She received her PhD in medical microbiology from the University of Cape Town and then worked for eight and a half years at the European Bioinformatics Institute in Cambridge as a team leader. At UCT, our research focuses on genetic- Recording in progress of susceptibility to diseases, African genome variation, and microbial genomics and infectious diseases from both the host and pathogen perspective. Our group provides bioinformatics services and training and develop new algorithms and resources for the analysis of complex African genetic data. Professor Muda is actively involved in capacity development, including training, education, and curriculum development in bioinformatics. She also sits on a number of international scientific advisory blog. Uh, Professor uh, Muda, when you're ready, you have the stage. Thank you very much. Um, let me just share my screen. Okay, so thank you very much to the organizers for the invitation to speak. Um, I'm gonna be talking about bioinformatics training and its implications for the SDGs in Africa. So I'm going to talk a bit about um, the SDGs and, and the role of data. What are the training needs and particular challenges? Uh, some efforts that have been going on uh, in, in addressing global bioinformatics training challenges. And um, then I'll talk specifically about SRA bio training and its impact and how we've leveraged it to potentially um, impact the SDGs. So the Sustainable Development Goals, as um, you probably discussed already in your conference, are you know, a set of goals by the um, UN that need to be achieved. And um, not all of them can be achieved. You know, we work in the bioinformatics or life sciences arena. So the ones I've selected that are probably most relevant would be zero hunger, good health and well-being, and life on land. And these can all be addressed to some extent with um, omics technologies, starting, uh, for example, with genomics. And the, th the key thing about these, um, the, the applying different omics um, technologies to address these SDGs is, is that data underpins everything. So data is how you get to, um, it's, it's what gets, it gets generated, it, it's, uh, it's what gets analyzed, and this is how you get to the information that can actually um, make a difference in people's lives or to these SDGs. So in a, in a basic life sciences experiment, you have this process of collecting samples from any different kind of organism, you collect metadata around those samples. There's some data QC and curation to be done. Um, and then you proceed to data analysis, interpretation, and ultimately translation of that into some sort of impact. So we have um, data generation technologies. We have um, the need to submit to public repository so that the, the data is accessible to as wide an audience as possible so that many scientists around the world can use the data to impact SDGs. And then you need computing infrastructure, tools and workflows, um, and visualization techniques to actually do the data analysis and interpretation. And then the translation is, is where the final impact comes. And often the, this part is sort of missed. And this is getting reports on the results to policymakers so that this can inform policy um, and produce products. So what you have here is a chain of getting data, converting that data into information, but information is not enough. We need to convert that through our analysis and interpretation into knowledge, and then obviously have products for downstream impact. 
So training is important along this whole um, chain because we need to have people with these underlying skills. And these are not necessarily skills that you learn in traditional curricula and in undergraduate curricula. We need to train sys admins. Now, sys admins tend to be working on you know, very much IT related stuff. They haven't always worked with finicky bioinformatics tools to, to get them in, installed on computing infrastructure. We need trained bioinformaticians from bioinformatics scientists to engineers to users. So the number of general challenges in, in training. So obviously you need qualified trainers who are knowledgeable in a, in a topic and are good trainers. Then you need to um, develop training materials so that you can actually have um, <clears throat> a good practice data sets, lectures and things to impart the knowledge. Often we're teaching a mixed audience that are coming in with very different backgrounds and, and in a basis of knowledge. You need to keep the audience engaged, assess competencies have been, um, or skills have been gained at the end of the training. And more recently, we've had to deal with going virtual. And then specifically in bioinformatics, there's a huge demand for people with bioinformatics skills. When we open um, the courses, um, adverts for courses, we get thousands of applications. And it's because bioinformatics really permeates all areas of, of life sciences. So bioinformatics topics are vast, which means it's really difficult to be an expert in, in everything. And they change rapidly as different uh, new technologies get emerge or change or updated. The audiences are broad, and so they need different levels of competency, depending on whether you're just going to use a bioinformatics tool or whether you're going to be developing algorithms from scratch. And um, they often need additional foundational skills, like some background knowledge in programming or statistics. And then the training itself requires theory and hands-on practice, and hands-on is much more difficult to do in the virtual setting. And we have very few trainees with standard bioinformatics education because it's not a traditional you know, undergraduate degree. So there've been several global efforts to address some of these challenges in bioinformatics training. So um, everything from managing broad audiences to um, having competencies and assessing them, um, having good, in, you know, a big pool of, of knowledgeable trainers and having training materials available. So some of these solutions include developing and using competencies, and I'll come back to that, using different training modalities, so, um, you know, mixed models, classrooms and things like that, and um, train the trainer to build up a, a good set of trainers who are really competent about bioinformatics training, and then having a, a set of resources for these trainers. So we've done this um, by engaging with the international community of bioinformatics trainers. Um, and so we, at Shreban, it's worked with Goblet, the Global Organization for Bioinformatics Learning, Education and Training, the International Society for Computational Biology Education Group, the Alexia European Research Infrastructure, Cabana, which is a training network in Latin America, and API Bionet, which is um, in um, the Asia Pacific. And so actually we organized uh, the first one, these are these bioinformatics um, education summits. And the aim is to bring bioinformatics trainers and educators together to drive the development of standards and guidelines for bioinformatics training um, and education that isn't kind of globally applicable. So we ran our first summit in May in Cape Town, and that was in 2019. Um, the two summits have run since then in 2020 and 2021, hosted by different groups, but these have been had to be held virtually. And so the format of these is very much uh, not a conference or symposium. We have minimal presentations, it's breakout working sessions so for trainers to come together and build resources, share their experiences, and have lots of discussions. So the kinds of um, outputs that we've been working on for those would be competencies. Um, and again, I'll, I'll describe this in a bit more detail. Guidelines for how to use these competencies. We've developed a curriculum endorsement or accreditation program for the ISCB to accredit courses from around the world. Um, some training resources, some train the trainer um, materials, discussed uh, tools and, and um, pra best practices for going virtual and best practices for training in low and middle income countries. So competency is basically what do you need, um, what does a bioinformatician or somebody who's going to use bioinformatics need to be able to do their work? So it's a skill or it's, it's, a, um, it's an ability and, and knowledge that's associated with a particular competency. So the ICB developed competencies several years ago and we've been refining them over time. So at these education summits, we've now got to version three of this, 
where we have um, quite detailed list of competencies and it's been expanded a bit to data science as well. And this is basically a list of things, as I said, that people need to do to be able to do their work. And then what you do is you map these to different levels to say, if I'm a mathematics user, I simply need knowledge of the algorithms. I don't need to know, you know, I don't need to try, make an algorithm myself. Whereas a mathematics engineer, needs the knowledge in absolute in-depth because they need to actually apply and, and um, develop these, these algorithms. And so we have this set of competencies and these are very much um, very useful for creating curriculum, for creating curricula in new training courses, but also for assessing. So if you wanna hire somebody and you wanna know you need them to do this particular job description, you can work out what competencies they need and make sure they've had that training or be able to assess that they have that competency. So these competencies are all available in uh, the EBI Competency Hub. Uh, the link is there, um, along with some other ones. And then you can also search the competencies in both learning paths. So for example, you come in as a user and say, I, um, I'm dabbled in this, but I want to be able to do you know, expert NGS data analysis. And then it shows you the competencies required to get to that point. And then you can go search for courses that will get you um, those competencies. So this is a very useful tool for, for driving the curriculum development and assessment of bioinformatics and data science training. So we've also developed a trainer portal where, you know, if you think about a trainer, they need training skills, they need to be able to design courses and create course, course materials and make these course materials available, make them fair. But then they also, you know, when they're designing courses, they need to know about course logistics, how to advertise courses, what software is associated. And then when they're running the courses, how to do continuous or, or end of course assessment of the, of the participants and then evaluation of their own training. So all these resources have been pulled together by this Education Summit, this global group of bioinformatics trainers into a trainer portal. And so some of the, the things that we've developed that go into this portal will be the competencies and their guidelines, trainer trainer programs and trainer guidelines, and then this trainer portal. So that's a global sort of set of um, activities for around bioinformatics training. But now if we look specifically at H3 Bionet, so for those who don't know, H3 Bionet is a Pan-African bioinformatics network designed, it was developed for uh, supporting the H3Africa Consortium, <clears throat> which is a human genomics consortium, but it really is broader than that and it, and it supports a wider group of um, genomics or omics researchers across the continent. So our key aim is to develop bioinformatics capacity, so it's capacity development, provides needs-based training events, whether those be virtual or, or online. We try to assess our training impact and you know, improve on it and develop high quality training resources and trainers. So our training activities include um, hackathons and courses. So these are, are uh, used to be face-to-face -face. and the hackathons are really objective driven. So you have a problem that you need to solve. For example, you need to develop some workflows or you need to analyze some data. You bring a mixture of multidisciplinary groups together and you, um, you address that question. At the end of the, you know, the output of the hackathon is, is actually a real product or, or, or a paper. Then we have our, our foundational training. So we have online um, introduction to bioinformatics courses, which we've been running for several years now. And we've now started running intermediate courses in very specific um, specialized topics. We have um, a worked with the carpentries. I'll come back to that um, to, to roll out some carpentries training. We do make sure our training materials are all available through training materials. And we have a train the trainer program. So our training environment includes not just the courses, um, but also like a whole ecosystem. So we've got this sort of the top level here, the, the audiences that we're trying to address from building trainers to your user scientists, engineer and systems administrators, the different kinds of training we offer each, the different modalities of training from hackathons to internships to um, remote classroom training. And then also things we, we try to build communities around our, our classrooms so that they can continue with this sort of support group and, and drive the field of bioinformatics. And then we also have various support um, resources, the training guides and, and um, all our templates. So we have um, kind of pioneered this several years ago when we started running our introduction to bioinformatics courses because we needed a much wider reach across the continent because of the demand. So we uh, started this multiple delivery training model where we have these remote classrooms in different uh, countries or different institutions. And at the time, there were physical classrooms. So you have a physical classroom located all across the continent that connects live to a single uh, classroom that's got the, the lecturer in it. They watch live videos, they do practicals. And in the classroom, they have a sysadmin for, for technical support. 
and uh, teaching assistants for um, any questions that uh, that um, and if they, they can't answer, then they go to the lecturer. So it builds this community, and it, some of these courses have gone up to over one thousand three hundred people attending them. They run for about three months. Um, and have two contact, contact sessions a week. So this has enabled us to run, to really scale up our training, run um, large scale courses, but still have that face-to-face -face and that community, smaller community feeling. So now these, these, uh, these um, physical classrooms are virtual classrooms. So they break out into different um, breakout rooms. So if we head back to now to, to the SDGs and we think, well, well how do we need you know how can training address help us to understand and implement the sdgs so you know for example health and and, and well-being so we need as i said this data information and knowledge and we've got all these different components and as i said data is you know underpins almost everything so for the computing infrastructure which is obviously fundamental you need to be able to run tools workflows and, and run them on a particular computer infrastructure We've addressed this by training systems administrators um, at different institutions who have computing software or who are running courses. So we've run an introductory and intermediate systems admin course for these um, particular bioinformatics applications so that they know how to get um, this finicky bioinformatics software running on these and can support their local bioinformaticians or, or bioinformatics users. We've developed how-to guides and um, the sys admins have often been involved in many of our hackathons and these online remote classroom courses. The other, um, the next component is the metadata curation, managing the data, submitting it to public repositories, making nice reports and products. And so for that, we train a range of people from bioinformaticians to researchers to data managers. And this is training specifically in data management, data curation, data standards, and data submission. Now, these are topics you would just not normally see in any curriculum. They are completely neglected, and yet they are fundamental to managing data in any major life science project properly. So these, this is very important training. Um, as I said, it, it usually gets neglected. The next thing, obviously, is the, is the you know, more exciting part, which is the analysis and inter interpretation of the data. So here we've tried to train bioinformatics scientists, engineers, and um, users. And um, because they, you know, they sometimes the topic areas overlap, or just, they just need different levels, there's a lot of overlap in the training of these sort of three different groups. So if you think about bioinformatics training, you know, you have the very um, applied stuff. So a user will just come in and use some tools to answer a research question. And then you have the more technical things where people are building algorithms to answer those questions. So at the top of the scale there, you would have the bioinformatics users. In the, somewhere in the middle, you have scientists who maybe do some algorithm development, some analysis, and you know, quite, quite advanced bioinformatics. And then the more bioinformatics engineers who do advanced bioinformatics, but also build the, build the algorithms and then the sysadmins as well. So these are just uh, some of the courses that we've run that apply to these different audiences. Um, you know, the first will be just sort of using tools and basic introduction. Then it goes into more um, intermediate courses. So, you know, very specialized in a particular kind of analysis, general topics like uh, data software and data carpentries for dev different foundational skills, and then workflows and hackathons, um, hackathons to develop workflows and you know, basic introduction to some technical topics. So your bioinformatics user will, will um, usually do some of the more introductory courses and then they'll pick one of the um, specialized courses depending on what their research interest is. And then your bioinformatics scientist will you know, tend to already have that basic information. And so they'll go into the more specialized courses and maybe some of the more technical things that will need to know about GitHub and you know, managing their software. And then the technical people will focus really on the bottom side of things, the far more technical applications associated with um, bioinformatics. So another key aspect, as I mentioned, is training trainers because we do not have enough bioinformatics trainers in the world, not only on the continent. And um, so trainers need to know how to design and deliver courses. And it's not something you get taught at your undergraduate or, or at university. Even as a lecturer, you come in and you're just expected to know this. You need access to training resources and materials. You need practice in training. Um, and it's nice to have a training community that you can work with. And so we've been developing trainer and um, trainers and the training resources. So we've got several projects. Um, we've run some bioinformatics instructional design online courses. We've run um, a course to develop some software and data carpentry instructors, and we have an online train the trainer course. I'll go through each of these in a bit more detail. So the train the trainer project is actually led by our University of Ibadan node, um, Angela Smile and Raphael. 
And it has several components, including training topics, training resources, and a team of trainers. And so they're both building resources and a community of trainers. Um, so the resources, you know, get basically build the, the, the skills in, in the trainers and build the um, materials and things that they need to do a good job training. And so they've built several resources and I'll hopefully make the slides available so that you can follow some of these links to, to what they've done. For the software and data carpentry, so this, this is basically an organization that um, is a group of instructors, trainers, maintainers, and helpers who um, teach foundational skills. So um, they have they offer workshops and training events. They have uh, already curated uh, lessons and, and resources. It's a very organized um, way, and they have a very specific way of teaching. It's very accessible to non-specialists. So it's very good for training bioinformatics users or your researchers or clinicians who need to dabble a little bit in the command line or, or Unix to be able to run a, a, you know, a workflow, for example. So they've got data carpentries, library carpentries, and software carpentries. So we've been trying in, in this project to build up and foster a community of carpentries instructors um, who can teach this foundational coding and, and, and data analysis skills at various institutions across the continent. Um, and because it's such a you know high demand, we wanted to get um, you know as many trained across the continent as possible. So we've recently uh, teamed up with Sadala, which is an organisation in South Africa who was running some instructor training, and so they got our some of our, our trainees on there. So we now have some qualified instructors at these various different countries um, across Africa. We'll increase that, and then we hope that these trainers will be rolling out um, training already. The South African group along with some of the other trainers have come together and um, ran a carpentries course last week, in fact, for um, Africa CDC, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute. We're also working with the uh, Goblet, the European Bioinformatics Institute and Welcome Connecting Science, uh, which is a big training program to build an online train the trainer course. And this will roll out um, in early 2022 using our remote classroom model. And the aim is to build this curriculum that includes you know, communication, planning and managing courses, um, training engagement and expertise and knowledge. So it's it kind of the whole picture about how to train rather than on a, a particular content. So over the years, Issue of has been training for you know, eight or nine years now, and um, we've trained more than 4,100 individuals um, across the continent. Our training surveys have shown that, this, that many of the training courses have enabled degrees, they've enabled some publications, and they've promoted collaboration. So they, they really have had an impact on, on the individuals who have attended these. Some, um, the number of trainees attending you know, courses per year has just increased over time. And this uh, sort of largest jump was uh, due to our remote classroom model, which enabled us to really reach a much wider audience. So the maps on the right show um, where the trainees coming from face-to-face -face training. Um, the one, the, the US one is actually from one of our hackathons. We had participation from the US um, and in Europe. And then you can see the, the map at the bottom. This is now our, our blended and, and online courses. And you can see we reach, uh, we're able to reach more people in more different countries. We have many people who attend more than one course, and many people just attend um, the introduction to bioinformatics because that's open to anybody, whereas many of our other courses, because of the huge demand, are, tend to be restricted to Asia Bounded or Asia Africa. But there are um, several hundred people who have uh, you know, 800 and something who've attended at least two courses, and then several, some who've attended up to 11 of our courses. So the most common combinations would be they do an introduction to bioinformatics, and then they do one of the specialized courses like the metagenomics, which is the 16S course or our NGS course. And then we also have professional development courses like um, grants management, scientific communication to build sort of the whole academic. So how have we leveraged um, HJ Binet training and you know, how, what does this impact it? So if you think about the, the pandemic, which has obviously hugely affected our training, we've managed to adapt and actually provide support for, for um, SARS-CoV-2 and other pathogens. So obviously this involves you know, all aspects of data again. And um, because we've had this big you know, success in our training, we're, we've now funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to, to run NGS training for the Africa Center for Disease Control Pathogen Genomics Initiative, which is a set of um, institutes, public health institutes around Africa who need to implement NGS for pathogen surveillance and genomic epidemiology for public health. And so we're building a curriculum for them. We've rolled out some um, 
training, some NGS training. So we, we've teamed up with um, Christian Happy's group at, in, in HGRD, who are the experts in, in, um, in this area of training. And so we're just helping on the mathematics side to help all the curriculum run these courses through our remote training model. So we've run um, a SARS-CoV-2 NGS course for wet lab. We're now running the bioinformatics course, which started this week. So the first course, we trained about 40 individuals at public health institutes in Africa. And what this means is that because it's in the public health space, there can be a real impact on, on um, good health and well-being and policy around this. So um, we hope that that training is actually making it a more direct impact. Another case is um, on the human side. So we, our Aisha Bionet's activities and outputs have led to some new collaborations. For example, um, our involvement in a new consortium to look at polygenic risk scores, um, some grants to look at rare diseases. And then in Asia Africa, we have this genome analysis working group, which has looked at um, meta-analysis across projects. And our training has been key in not only in providing the workflows in that, but providing trained people who, who are able to undertake these analysis. And again, this is impacted, has a potential impact for health. So the, that analysis resulted in this paper in Nature last year, uh, where we looked at um, high depth African genomes. And you can see the huge, it was very much African led and, and many of these people were trained um, uh, or connected to, to Estria Bionet. And so some of the key findings from this paper were 3.4 million novel variants in African populations. And this was a reasonably small subset of African data. Um, the fact that many of the African populations, African individuals are walking around with um, up to 14, in some cases, clinval pathogenic variants. We've identified potential loss of function variants that are very, very much across uh, geographical locations regions of selection that are linked to diseases. And um, in many of the key disease-related um, variants, we've identified major geographical differences um, in their distributions. And so these can inform health and inform, you know, perhaps building new um, screening tools um, or pharmacogenomics or, or um, working towards precision medicine. And then a final example is, is looking at other life forms and um, the Africa Biogenome Project, which I'm sure you'll hear about in the next talk. And so we've also been able to leverage what we've done with um, some of our tools and workflows. And obviously our training will come important, become important in here. And we've already got individuals in Asia Bionet, many individuals in Asia Bionet across the continent involved in the Africa Biogenome Project. And this is the potential to impact several of the SDGs, you know, anything that's related to life forms and understanding life forms better. We try to, um, so while we've reached many audiences in our actual classrooms, we also try to make everything accessible. So we make our training materials fair, that's findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So we curate these training materials because we know we, we, we put them on YouTube and that, but they need to be findable. So we make sure that they are, they are tagged, somebody can easily find where those materials are and actually reuse them. And then finally, just uh, so some of our other outputs, which might be useful to the communities. We've got this um, training guide and the training support pack. So every time we run a course, we have set templates, you know, training timeline on you know, what you need to do when, when you're running a, a virtual versus an, an online course, how to cost the course. And then um, through these global um, efforts, we've also done some, made, done some publications in challenges and considerations for delivering bioinformatics training in omics. Uh, ten simple rules for organizing bioinformatics training in, in low, middle and income countries. And more recently, we um, just in the final stages of a ten simple rules for buying, starting bioinformatics from scratch. And so we're also working with the global community on building infrastructure and training in LMIX. Where we're building guidelines, um, working out how you, you know, disseminate to, to other areas um, that are slightly less resourced and uh, becoming language barriers, etc. And so finally, with back to the sustainable developing goals, as I said, data is key to, to really understanding and, and addressing these. And so skills are required at all levels of data management, access, um, analysis, and interpretation. And so through our training ecosystem, we've tried to develop skills in different audiences so that people are well-placed to tackle these. But we're also building scientific leaders for the future. So we don't want to just have skills, you know, basic skills to analyze data. We want those rounded skills like communication, uh, leadership, so we have high quality African leaders um, pushing the agenda for the SDGs. So with that, I'd like to thank um, particularly the Oli Estrebana Consortium, but particularly the Education and Training Work Package members, all of them, 
the leads are Sean Aaron and Verena Rass and um, the NIH for our funding. And thanks again for the invitation to speak and for your attention. Hello, thank you, Professor Nikki Mulder, for that uh, concise and inspiring talk. Uh, we indeed apologize for starting 16 minutes behind schedule. Yeah, so we'll be taking some questions. I don't even want to ask. Okay, yeah, we have a question there. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm sorry for my question because I came late. I don't know whether that has been addressed. But the question is that what is the on site cost and duration of training a bioinformatics user of molecular biology background at the H3 Barnet? So we don't charge for our courses. So we, we have every single one of our courses has been free for the attendee. Um, and that is because we're funded, we have training coordinators, um, and then we rely on volunteers to do the training. We, we might, you know, give them um, an honorarium. So our trainees have, you know, no, no cost. That's the thing about bioinformatics training is, is that um, you just need a computer. So you don't need to buy consumables for the practicals, et cetera. So our biggest cost when we were doing face-to-face -face training was flying people in. Um, so it tended to cost if we were having a, a five-day intensive training and we flew in all the trainees and trainers for five for five days and had you know six days accommodation, all the food, everything, it costed around forty thousand US dollars. Um, and that's because of the cost of flights and visas and accommodation. But with our remote training, there's absolutely no cost at all. Um, people can just join online or go to their local classroom in their own institution. Thank you, Prof, for the training, uh, the wonderful presentation. But if I get your uh, statistics right, it appears as if uh, West Africa is left behind in the training course. Well, what are you actually doing, or what are the, your future plans to expand the frontiers of training in West Africa precisely? Thank you. So actually, when we look at our, our numbers, um, the biggest set of trainees is from uh, the biggest the two countries with the most number of trainees is Nigeria and South Africa. Um, some of the other countries around there, it, it has very much depended on. So for the um, introduction to bioinformatics courses, some of the French speaking countries, we have had French speaking countries join those, but there sometimes is a language barrier. So what we do is we translate our, our transcribe our materials so that the um, the English trans sub subtitles are there, which helps a little bit. And we have local French trainers. Um, but it also very much depends on where we have people on the ground, because these courses need people who can host the classrooms, who can you know, um, facilitate the classrooms. So th that's been one of our limitations. But we have expanded that. So as people, more people come on the courses, they are then able to, to address them. But as I say, if, we, if you look at specific countries, Nigeria um, in West Africa is actually one of the most attended, um, has, the, has one of the highest number of attendees. So um, yeah, again, it's, it depends on, on reach uh, and spreading the word. And so if we have people on the ground in those countries, then we tend to, to be able to reach them much more easily. Okay, um, my question goes like this. I uh, would love to know about uh, the requirement for, for lecturers. I mean, I think you have a section called uh, training the trainers. Uh, you know, so what is the re requirement to, to fit in that category? Yeah, even though um, I do have the, 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 the background and, and so what do we have to do to apply to join that category? So, um, we, you know, we, we make the assumption that everybody, you know, if you're in a lecture position or if you've taught before that you have some experience. Um, and when we build up our trainees, we usually have people who've attended the course. The next year, they become teaching assistants. And then the, the year after that, they become, you know, the full trainers. And so what we usually do is people who we're not sure about, um, you know, if you have qualifications, you've run training courses and we see that. And, you know, we've seen evaluations of the courses and, you know, we've seen that you're absolutely successful and there's no need to do training. Um, 
if we're not sure or the, the new lecturer is not sure, then they will shadow, you know, we'll have two teams, a lecturer teams, the main team, and then we'll have kind of a shadow team. <clears throat> and so you, it's also to learn the content of the course, but we don't have a specific criteria. You know, we know <clears throat> if you can demonstrate that you know your topic area very well, and you know you've taught before when the response was good then then there's no barrier at all to to joining that these train the trainer courses are to really build up additional skills that you wouldn't have learned otherwise like specifically for bioinformatics you know how do you assess whether somebody's online practical is going well or you know how do you um build those materials you know what is a good way to to impart knowledge when it comes to bioinformatics skills Yeah, all right. Uh, we have a question from Dr. Ituno. Thank you, Nikki. I posted a question on the chat. I was asking if the training needs um, have changed over the years. I know you have been in this for a long time. And then if it has changed, what would you say is the direction for the future? That's one question. My second question is about follow-up. I see a lot of people joining our IBT courses, NGS courses. They, they always tend to be interested to join. And then for me, the follow-up seems to be even more important than just the training. So is it, is it possible that we can begin to think about having a project assigned to these training courses that they can then demonstrate what they have learned so if you look, if you've been on um, Coursera before, there's something they call capstone projects for their courses, where you then take it's not compulsory, but if you want to get a certificate for that project, you can take a capstone project and do it, and then you get a certificate of proficiency that you have been able to to complete that. So I I just did one for Coursera, and I thought that that would be very um, useful for us in the H two environment. Thank you. Thanks. So to answer your first question, yes, the, the topics have evolved. Um, so we've had to respond to where people have, you know, suddenly they've suddenly got new data types. So in Asia Africa, it was first mostly just genomics, and we did, you know, GWAS, and then they were starting to generate NGS data. And then we had microbiome projects, so we switched to teaching 60s. Um, and now, you know, the more people who've got RNA-seq, and I think single cell analysis will come too. For um, the pathogens, you know, we were supposed to teach generally on, on pathogens, and then all of a sudden the pandemic came around. So we had to quickly adapt and teach specifically on SARS-CoV-2. So it's quite adaptable. If you think about the underlying technologies and the techniques, they're very similar. It's just usually applied in a slightly different way or the, the technology is advanced a bit. So we adapt both in the topic area, but also within a topic area, you know, the, the latest algorithms for the latest technology. So we try to keep up to date as much as possible. Um, but I think the most important is to also have foundational skills so that people come in, um, you know, with, with enough knowledge to be able to learn those techniques. In terms of the follow-up, so we have two ways of, of following up. Number one, we've been working and we've had a lot of these discussions with Africa CDC because we need to have people mentored. You know, we don't want to leave classrooms. So that's why in our IBT classrooms, what we've tried to do is build communities. So at the end of the class, we will try to talk about the open learning circles. Um, we've got an open science group and can encourage the local classrooms to build these open learning circles so that they continue to interact and you know, support each other. Each course has an assessment. Um, and so you only get your certificate if you've you know, done your assessment. And then we have these long-term impact surveys you know, to say, did it enable you to do your project and that. It's a good idea for us to actually have a project. So for the genomic medicine course that we ran for nurses, they actually all each classroom had to do a research project at the end. Um, and, and hand that in sort of several weeks later. And that really helped to cement the knowledge. So I think it's a really good idea to have a you know, more formal project that people can choose to do. We have, as I say, you know, implemented it to some extent in different ways, but it, it could be probably you know, better formalized and have this, you know, this downstream mentorship support group um, to enable that to happen. All right, thank you. Yo, we'll take one final question and then we hand this. Uh, thank you very much Paul, for that wonderful uh, presentation. Even I came in a very, a very bit late. I want to find out, um, in, after your presentation, I quickly also Googled your website and then I checked um, where you have a uh, training and I can't find anything there. I just want to find out, um, when do you open the application? Is it quarterly or once a year or how long in a year? So that uh, some of us can take advantage of this um, very rare privilege. So the website is uh, h3abionet.org. 
And then under there, there's a tab for training and it lists all our upcoming training events and all the past training events. Our Introduction to Mathematics courses runs um, annually. And so those normally open sort of um, towards uh, the beginning of the year, the uh, introduction, the, the intermediate course is busy running now, but the best is to, um, we've got a mailing list, an announcement mailing list, and the best is to get onto that mailing list and look at the Twitter. So the Twitter feed, the HRA Barnett uh, Twitter feed uh, lists, advertises all our courses, um, and so that's probably the best way to keep up to date with when our courses are running. But our training schedule differs by year, so there isn't a fixed time when applications open, it's just a matter of keeping up to date through you know these notifications on Twitter um, or our announcement mailing list, or just keeping checking the website. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, one final question from me before we call it a day here. Uh, from the look of things, it appears that Africa is no longer where we were in terms of bioinformatics training five years ago with the help of IBT trainings and all those things. But it appears to me as though when it comes to the aspect of data management, it looks so, uh, what I, I don't sound that developed, like we've not really upskilled in that area. So I just want to ask, what's the plan of H3A Bionet to upskill data management in Africa? Yeah, in Africa. So we have a data management project um, and that has rolled out, basically pulled together a whole lot of data management guides. It's got a link to all the uh, online data management plans from different funders. And we ran a data management course um, a few months ago, a couple of months ago, and that it covers things like ethics of data, data, you know, data curation, um, data management plans, how to make data fair, etc. So we have that course and that's actually available online. All the materials are available online. And because it was so popular, we're going to run it again. So we'll probably run that course twice a year. Um, but those materials are available and all the resources are available um, because it's key. I mean, we've just got a new grant now. And the first thing we're going to do is get everybody trained on how to manage, you know, how to build a data management plan. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you for honoring the invitation. I'll be, uh, please can you put on a round of applause for the key with that? Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, so we'll be going to the next presenter and I will try to uh, invite Dr. Lenny to share the session. Uh, thank you very much all the participants for your questions and thank um, Nikki Muda for providing adequate answers to all the questions. We'll move straight to the next presenter, who is um, Dr. Tengod Ebenezer, who will be presenting the African Biogenome Project, Progress and Perspective. Over to you, sir. Can you see my screen? Hello? Yes, we can see it. All right, okay. Thank you. So uh, my name is Thank God uh, Ebenezer, and I'm a bioinformatician at the European Bioinformatics Institute. Um, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me uh, to the uh, second conference of the Nigerian Bioinformatics and Genomics uh, Network. And uh, today I'm gonna to be talking to us about the African Biogenome Project, uh, which focuses on genomics for the future of biological diversity. So this would be, this talk over the next 15 minutes would be a shift from uh, the human side of things into um, other living systems that we have in our ecosystems, plants, animal, and as well as other eukaryotic microbes. So just a bit of, of an outline, I'm gonna be talking to us about providing a background to myself and also a background to the goals and vision of the African Biogenome Project, what the uh, value propositions are, the potential delivery timeline, the steering committee, as well as what we aim to do over the next few years. So a bit of a biography. Hello, can you hear me? So I, I need to. So um, I, I grew up in Nigeria. And then I did my um, undergraduates at the uh, Inamdi Azikwe University. I studied parasitology. Then I did my uh, master's at the University of Lagos, did my service at uh, in Nasarawa State. And then I worked for Shell for a few years uh, before moving to the University of Cambridge for my PhD. I worked at the University of Oxford um, uh, where I did uh, it, uh, some research as well and at the University of Dundee. 
I did my postdoc at the Elam Institute, which is the UK National Facility for Genomics. And then before moving to the European Bioinformatics Institute uh, in Hingston, uh, near Cambridge, where I currently work as a bioinformatician. So one of the things, again, I aim to do basically is to build um, communities. And today I'm going to be talking to us about uh, the African biogenome uh, communities. But then again, there's also the Uglena International Network, which was a fallout from, from, uh, from my PhD. And then we have the African Biogenome Project that I started to build during my postdoc. So um, in addition to that, I also believe that genomics for all must entail building local networks and capacities. And a few years ago, um, uh, myself and, and Dr. Shehu Fatuma also joined efforts to set up the Nigerian Bioinformatics and Genomics uh, Network, uh, where we then had, um, had the first conference in Lagos. Then at the same time, I also helped to set up the uh, Nam Jazikwe University Genomics and Bioinformatics Consortium, mainly initiating it and ensuring that at the local level, we have the capacity and the information people need in order to uh, engage bioinformatics, uh, basically. So today, uh, I'm going to be talking to us specifically about the African Biogenome Project. And uh, what is the African Biogenome Project? Uh, mainly, the idea is to uh, generate um, uh, sequences and sequence uh, species for uh, more than 100,000 species across the continent of Africa. And the goal here for the Africa Biogenome Project, otherwise uh, called Africa BP, is to coordinate all non-human species sequencing efforts across the continent, act as a forum, act as a forum for the non-human space, initiate, develop, and support um, new genome sequencing, as well as looking at the more than 100,000 endemic species on the African continent. We're looking at plants, animals, as well as other eukaryotic microbes that share uh, the environment with us. And finally, we aim that we will to deploy this data into sequencing uh, um, um, uh, databases, biobanks across the continent, and also work with other organizations such as the Africa Center for Disease Control. For instance, we potentially be looking at how can we use biodiversity information to actually prevent uh, epidemics and pandemics in the future. We also aim to uh, work with the Africa Union into Africa Bureau for Animal Resources. And ultimately, we aim that this data generated will inform policy and build capacity on the continent. So just a bit of a background into the bioinformatics aspect and what has what the motivation has been for this project. First, we know that the global biodiversity landscape is a shared heritage and nearly all continent is endowed with a form of biodiversity. And we also do know that there is a six mass extinction uh, currently happening. And But then if we act now and we act using genom genomic and genetic uh, information, we will be able to turn the tide. And we also do know that um, since 1970, about 52% of earth bred mammals have actually gone extinct. This, this basically includes 39% of land-based species, 39% of uh, marine species, and of course, 76% of freshwater species. And uh, the earth terrestrial hotspots basically include nearly all continents. We have North America, Africa, and Southeast Asia. But today, I'm going to be foc focusing on the African continent. So, we know that uh, Africa plays a huge role when it comes to biodiversity, particularly because the continent of Africa is uh, very rich when it comes to uh, biodiversity and it's an essential component for global biodiversity hotspots. So we know that the continent of Africa, or Africa rather, have uh, deserts, um, intrazonal open woodland, uh, as well as several types of um, um, biodiversity uh, configurations that would uh, expect to have. But the point is, we know that the human activities pose a significant threat um, to the global biodiversity. And there are five threats um, that are currently affecting the global biodiversity. And the first one is land and sea use change. The second one is uh, pollution. The third one is over spe uh, species over, over exploitation, mainly looking at overfishing as well as other ex exploitation of biological resources. The fourth one is climate change, uh, mainly which forces animals to shift their range. And the fifth one is invasive species and diseases, as we've seen with uh, uh, COVID-19, as well as other zoonotic diseases and um, other diseases that move from human to, to, uh, to man, to uh, animals, rather. So we know also that the global biodiversity loss is happening at an unprecedented scale. And that means we need an unprecedented urgency to help reverse this trend. Uh, for instance, this diagram shows the, the biodiversity losses uh, when compared to intact ecosystems. Uh, for instance, you could see here in, in Africa, you know, the areas colored blue mainly used to be the intact ecosystem. And the area that begins to turn red are mainly areas that when you compare it to the intact ecosystem and the biodiversity loss, it tells us that this is happen happening at an unprecedented scale. 
So there are two revolutionary projects uh, that have helped us or helping us to understand, uh, to advance our understanding uh, basically in the life sciences. Um, the first one is the Human Genome Project, well, which was completed nearly 20 years ago. And it helps us uh, to understand the human health, mainly revolutionary, revolutionizing our understanding of the human health. And the second one is the Earth Biogenome Project, which we believe in 20 years will help improve our understanding of uh, the biosphere. Uh, the Earth Biogenome Project uh, basically was launched about 10 years ago. The idea was to sequence all 1.5 million known species. And actually the number has gone up to over 1.8 million now because new species are being discovered, which means that this needs to be added uh, to the list. So and one of the things um, I started to do uh, when I was a postdoc at the ELAM Institute was I started to build a community called the Digital Innovation in Africa for a Sustainable Agri-Environment. So the idea was to deploy portable genome sequencing across the continent of Africa. At that time, I was working on this initiative with um, um, Rob Davy at the ELAM Institute. And as well as Apollonia Jean King at the University of Edinburgh, mainly at the Center for Tropical Livestock Genetics and Health. So when I moved to the European Bioinformatics Institute in Hingston, I linked up with um, uh, Mark Blaxer and also Harris Lewins in order to set up the African Biogenome Project to sequence all known species across the continent of Africa. And the project, uh, basically, the Africa Biogenome Project is, uh, is Africa led, and the idea is that it has to be led from the continent of Africa. And this is now being chaired by uh, Professor. Uh, Professor and a Mogai at the Jomo Koyenta University. So what is the aim of the African Biogenome Project? The idea is to sequence all known genomes indigenous to the continent of Africa. So we aim that uh, this would be used to contribute to the Center for uh, um, Disease Control at the Africa Union, Africa CDC, as well as AU IBA, as well as any other uh, African agency that requires genetic resources and biological resources in order to advance national and regional goals. So the DC network is basically a component of the Africa Biogenome Project with the Africa Biogenome Project representing all non-human uh, non uh, uh, systems, uh, mainly, and it's an umbrella um, uh, project. And we envisage that over the next few years, some, some um, models, again, will be connected to this Africa Biogenome Project apart from this network. So um, one of the key things for us is that we're, we're looking at biogenomes for food systems and as well as conservation across the continent. And we aim that DC would be used to um, um, as will basically serve as an exemplar in Africa BP. So what is DC? Uh, DC is a flagship community network within Africa BP to support genome gather sustainable development, uh, sustainable agricultural practices and conservation uh, across the continent. And the idea for us is to um, look at how do we go from sequencing genomes, looking at diversity variations to applications in crop and animal, in, in animal improvement, and particularly using this information to build resilient food systems and well being. So, I must mention that um, the idea of sequencing genomes, especially in plants and animals, is not new to the continent of Africa. There are communities already doing this. For instance, the African Orphan Crop Consortium, um, the idea again um, with the AOCC, they are sequencing over 100, over 100 uh, um, African orphan crops uh, endemic to the African continent. But what we are saying as part of the Africa BP is a large scale sequencing effort, high throughput, looking at other areas that have not been explored because Africa is very rich in, in biodiversity and there are so many species that have, that have not been es es explored. So the idea behind Africa BP is to um, um, uh, motivate this conversation and deliver on this project. So Africa BP will cover all ecorotic lineages. So we are looking at all classifications of vertebrates, looking at the warm-blooded mammals, bears, fish, reptiles, amphibians, we're also looking at invertebrate from arthropod all the way to uh, nematode. And of course, we are looking at plants, algae, protozoa, and fungi. So at the moment, we're not, going, we're not basically looking at other uh, prokaryotes, uh, uh, basically because um, they could be, they could, it's, it's gonna be a different project altogether. So what are the challenges? Uh, for us, we aim to solve uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals 02. We aim to ensure zero hunger on the continent. And this connects uh, basically with the Africa Agenda 2063, which aims to see and improve biological resources across the continent. First, looking at zero hunger, and second, looking at ensuring that we, uh, we actually improve the biological resources in Africa. So one question we might ask would be, is it possible to sequence all eukaryotic uh, organisms? Across the world, this is already happening with several continents and countries and projects springing up in terms of looking at sequencing species, for instance. Uh, in the UK, we have the Darwin Tree of Life and also 
um, we also have the Sangha Tree of Life. In Europe, we have the European Reference Genome, which was launched this year. In Australia, we have the Genomics for Australian Plants. And of course, in Chile, we have the 1000 uh, um, Genome Project for Chile. So all of these projects are working, you know, looking at the regional and national uh, uh, sequencing efforts. So what are the grand challenges? What are the problems we want to solve within the African Biogenome Project? So there are five grand challenges that we feel, we, we believe rather, that will deliver value to the African people. The first one is genomics and bioinformatics technologies for the agri-environment. So we believe that through this, we'll be able to deliver capacity in terms of uh, comp using comprehensive project-based capacity approach uh, in order to build capacity across the continent and also ensure technology, technology development within, within the continent. We want to use the data again to um, improve crops and livestock health. We also want to look at conservation for endangered and endemic species particularly and as well as looking at socioeconomics, ethics and policy issues, because there are, we believe that there are so many issues that, that are going to arise as, as, as part of this project. So we want to be able to use this data from this project to actually deliver on this. And finally, we want to be able to um, 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 basically exchange knowledge and as well as ensure that we build you know, technologies on the continent for the African people. So all of this connects to the value proposition and ultimately to the capacity building effort on the continent. So I also must mention that the idea is to sequence these genomes on the continent of Africa and basically not to send them out. So the idea again would be that we'll, be, we'll use um, sequencing platforms and other uh, uh, um, capacities we already have. And uh, Professor Nigimoda mentioned the HTBionet contribution. And we also acknowledge the fact that the HTBionet has actually built foundation for bioinformatics and genomics on the continent. So Africa people would leverage on this uh, capacities and in order to advance the, 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 the projects that have been set out within the Africa Biogenome Project. So um, Jera, I'm gonna talk briefly about the pilot studies. So we started this project. Um, so the idea behind Africa BP started uh, a few years ago, but actively um, uh, uh, in March last year. And we've basically been kind of doing more of consultations, speaking to people and formulating the conceptual framework that, uh, that is required to actually deliver on this project because it, we anticipate it's gonna be a complex project and it's also gonna require a lot of access benefit sharing and so many other uh, um, um, challenges that would envisage and that would potentially come up as, you know, as part of this project. So we want to address this by, uh, we started by starting with a pilot uh, project, which we believe will reveal strengths and weaknesses so the idea is to sequence about 2,500 species across the continent of Africa in three years. So we started this with a partnership with the Vertebrate Genome Project. And as well as uh, recently we have on board the 10 KP. So with the Vertebrate Genome Project, we will be, we aim to sequence about 500 species over the next three years uh, with a VGP uh, in Rockefeller. And with the 10 KP, we have a list of species that will, will basically we sequence. These are, good, these are going to be plant species uh, specifically for the continent of Africa. And we've started to populate this species for the 10KP project. And for the VJP, we aim that over the next few weeks, we'll, have the first, uh, we'll be able to have the first genome sequence, uh, hopefully in South Africa as part of this uh, project. So we, again, the idea is to ultimately work with the Africa Academy of Sciences and other African agencies on the continent of Africa. And of course, we're open for partnerships. So this slide, basically shows a summary of all the subcommittees that have been set up from the sampling, collection, sequencing, all the way to partnership and fundraising and communications and public affairs. So I'm just gonna just talk about one, one of the subcommittee, which is the sample collection committee, which we believe is the biggest bottleneck in terms of um, navigating all of the legal issues, the ethical issues and things, uh, and the access benefit sharing, uh, in, more particularly the Nagoya protocol for access, access benefit sharing. So again, we have a, a committee who have been working on this and defining the framework to ensure that um, this, 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 this is possible uh, on the continent of Africa. And they, they've been able to identify the key elements that will ensure that this works. So I mentioned previously that the foundation of genomics has been built, uh, particularly by History Africa, as well as other uh, uh, communities across the continent. For instance, Acacia, which basically looks at plants, and the AOCC, the West African Virus Epidemiology, the uh, Baker Inri in Nairobi, as well as the Africa into Africa Bureau for Animal Resources. So the idea is to how do we consolidate on all of this and deliver on the African Biogenome Project. So we, in June, we were able to put together the pilot committee and we have a draft organogram mainly. So we have the steering committee, 
We have the partners and collaborators. We have the advisory board. We have the science and technology committee and the monetary committee who will be able to monitor the progress. And the idea is that the countries in Africa will have this data and be able to drive this project from within their countries. You will believe that it's, it's easier and better um, for countries, uh, for sequences, genomes to be sequenced in the countries of origin. So the question is, or rather the, the plan is for us to support countries to do this at the national level. So we have the uh, coordinators, regional coordinators from North Africa, West Africa, Central, Southern Africa, and East Africa. And of course, in all of this, we have a uh, specific uh, nodes for each of the countries. So this is the um, um, pictures of all, uh, the, all members of the steering committee who have been contributing to this project. And there are also others which I will acknowledge in the, in the slide. So in the advisory board, we have Professor Nicola Moda, um, the PI for HG Bionet. We have uh, Rob Davy, um, head of e infrastructure, who I was working with previously on, on this, on the, on the uh, actual genome sequencing site at the Airline Institute. And we have um, Dr. Simplice Noala, who has the agriculture and food security um, uh, department of the African Union in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. So we also have a website which you can please check out. We just um, launched the website uh, this, this month. And um, so we also tend to populate information um, regularly. So we also have a social media presence. So you can check us out on Twitter, um, Daisy underscore Africa BP, or go to the website. And there is a Google group where you can join. So we have a mailing list with over 450 subscribers. And you can follow us on Facebook, on Twitter, on LinkedIn. And yeah, I think that's just so to Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And those are the platforms we are on. So I would, with this, I would like to thank uh, all members of the Africa BP committee. So um, there are over uh, 50, 70, or 100 uh, members, uh, basically, who are working to deliver on this project. And many of us basically. Uh, came, finally came together, all of everyone within the committee finally came together during the um, um, uh, kickoff meeting we had this past June. So I would also like to thank all the institutions that have signed the Africa BP MOU, History Bionet, the National Institute for Communicable Diseases, Beijing Genomics Institute in China, the University of California, Davis, and University of Portacourt, Ethiopian Biotechnology Institute, Kenya Marine uh, Fisheries Research Center, MGI in China, in South Africa rather, and Kaba, I'm just about all the partners that have signed this MOU. And with this, I would like to thank you all for listening and I would be happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank God Ebenezer for that insightful and rich academic um, uh, profile and presentation. And we want to appreciate you for what you're doing on, um, on the African Biogenome Project. So time for questions and answers. Thank you for your presentation. So um, in the event that uh, you're successful with the project, and I believe you will be, uh, what's the plan to make this data available? To, to African scholars and those who wish to, to, to use it for other projects? Is it going to be public access? Like we see, uh, like maybe UK buy bank, something like that. Yes. Yeah, so so in, in terms of the data, um, there are two things we're, we're hoping would happen. So the first thing is that the, the data will be owned by the countries of origin where the samples are coming from. So which is why we have the node structure. So each Africa BP node represents Africa BP in that country. So we believe again that ultimately each, all genomic data find their way into two databases, the European Nucleotide Archive or the NCBI basically. So we also believe that at some point this data will be able to get to um, um, uh, one of these databases and which if it gets to one, ultimately it gets to the other because they kind of pull things uh, uh, from there. So we, we believe, we, encourage the national nodes to make their data publicly available uh, for the countries and also for the continent and ultimately uh, for uh, other partners uh, across the world. Thank you for your presentation, very insightful. 
Uh, my concern is about uh, sample collection. It's a very huge project. Uh, project. You mentioned that uh, you will collect samples across um, Africa, indigenous and endemic biological species. How do you intend to achieve this? Looking at the fact that some species are already getting into extinction, some are somehow declining in cultivation, and we also have some that are, we call orphan crops. You mentioned something about uh, African uh, Consortium on the Orphan Crop, AOCC. And again, what is your connection with um, AOCC that are working on orphan crops across Africa? Don't you duplicate what they are doing? And lastly, in our sample collection, identification is key. The moment you miss out about identification, you will have a wrong sequence for a wrong plant. How do you want to achieve that? Thank yeah, you. Thank you. So I think for the first question, which um, has to do with um, the, okay, I, I think I'm just gonna take, take the AOCC side of things first. With the AOCC, one of the things we're doing as part of the Aqua Biogenome Project is to uh, connect with existing projects. So the, we don't aim to duplicate any effort because it costs a lot to sequence just one genome. So we connect to existing projects and we are able to track with projects trying to sequence genomes. For, for instance, um, if you, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are in talks with AOCC, uh, basically to have them on board, we've had a um, 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 meeting in order to, in order to uh, connect uh, properly on that. So we're just waiting to formalize things. So I, I think that is, that is one. So with, Africa BP is set up to be able to track what each consortium or each project is doing. So, which is why we have a partnership framework that have institutional partner, associate project partner, and um, uh, corporate partner. That way we're able to know who is doing what and when, so that we don't duplicate effort. So in terms, in terms of species identification, so one of the things we have in the pilot committee is that we have a taxonomic working group within the subcommittee of within the sample subcommittee of the pilot committee. So the taxonomic, the taxonomic working group, their main job mainly is to address this concern I just read. These are specialists across the continent. Again, the idea is to use African scientists supported by uh, um, non-African scientists outside the continent. So the, the group mainly focuses on identifying these species because they have this expertise, they've built quite a lot of experience. So they are the ones that deals with all of, all of this, uh, particularly for the project. So with your third question, I, I think if you can just echo it again, I will try to, I'm trying to remember, remember it again. So do you mind just? About identification. About what, pardon? Identification, identification. Yeah, yeah I, just, I just addressed that, uh, which has to do with the taxonomic working group, because I thought you had the first question. Sample collection across Africa. Sample collection across Africa. Yeah, so with sample collection across Africa, one of the things we started to do is that we aim to work with biobanks. We aim to work with museums and zoos in order to collect the samples. So there, are, there, there, are, there is going to be ultimately two types of sample collection. First, from established sample custodians, such as zoos and, and museums and aquariums. You know, we, we, we already started that with the sample in, in South Africa and hopefully very soon we'll be able to get that through. So that is the first one. So these, these samples are already established. They've been there. They are properly um, you know, documented and archived. So that is the first one. So the second one would be trying to explore other species um, across the continent that are not in zoo. And we believe that Africa people would help zoos, museums, aquariums to be able to see the need to start um, documenting these species and start identifying these species. And that will also support the biobank, the regional biobanks, uh, for instance, CDES in Senegal, and as well as other museums across the continent. And I, I also would like to mention, uh, talk about the extinction of species. You know, uh, how do you sample species when they are in extinction? So one of the things we are doing, especially with the sample, um, hopefully coming from South Africa soon, is that we for species that we think that are going extinct, we, we don't aim to kind of sacrifice them or kill them. So we'll probably just maybe collect blood samples and you know. Some samples that we think does not necessarily have 
to entail killing this, this person. And I think by that way, we don't have to kill this person because they are already endangered. And ultimately, the, this project aims to conserve species, particularly those that are of ex, uh, going into extinction. And that is the focus of the vertebrate, uh, the Africa BP vertebrate genome project uh, partnership. Many at the first instance, looking at 18 species that are endemic and endangered across the continent of Africa. So we won't be killing species, uh, we'll mainly be kind of taking blood samples um, where they are going extinct. Thank you. Uh, my question is that, can you please share with us the timeline for this project since you are open for partnership and collaboration? So that uh, interesting individual will know when to key into the project. Thank you. Yeah, so we aim to sequence um, about 100,000 species in 10 years. Um, so we understand the challenges that would come with, with, with the project, you know, you know, looking at the infrastructures in Africa and looking at the other challenges that we anticipate. So in 10 years, we aim to sequence over 100,000 species. However, in the first three years, we aim to focus on sequencing 2,500 species. And all of these projects I, I mentioned now, we already have contributions in terms of species nominations, uh, particularly. So from 2022, we also aim to inter inter intensify on this. So we'll take the last uh, question. Good morning, sir. Thank uh, you for the presentation. Uh, from your presentation, I could see that Africa BP centers on genome of eukaryotes in Africa. And I can see that you are more particular about the laser eukaryotes. What are you doing about we, that we are the shape eukaryotes? Are you doing anything, maybe in partnership with other network to concerning the genome of the chief eukaryote? Yeah. Like, like humans, right? Yeah. So like human. So again, we we are working with the uh, History Africa. So uh, Professor Nikki Moda mentioned that. So and History, History Bionet is actually a, a, an institutional partner within Africa BP. So it is important that we box things up. So we would like to focus on um, the uh, non-human side of things because we already have the History Africa focusing on species and other sequencing of human genomes. But we want to focus our effort on areas that are not explored and which are uh, non-human species that are, or that are that are not as explored as the human species, so which are plants, animals, you know, other eukaryotes that helps us, you know, that keeps the ecosystem um, going, uh, uh, basically. So I think that is that is one aim. So we, we don't want to we it, we already have Italy Africa doing that. So we want to focus on areas that we think uh, needs more exploration and uh, that will, that we will be able to make more impact. Thank you, sir. We have um, online participants. We want you to take uh, maybe one or two questions from the chat. Okay, so um, shall I just uh, randomly take one? Or... Go ahead, sir. Okay. Uh... So someone said, I can see that you have a very huge project and that you have an established sharing team. However, how do you identify, recruit, and train your ground working expert, if I may use that term? So um, I would like to mention that the emphasis of Africa BP is capacity, 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 and it is at the heart of the project. And in doing that, the emphasis again is to deploy project-based comprehensive capacity across the continent, mainly looking at those plants and plants and animals that are close to the close to, close to the people in Africa and that are endemic or that are indigenous to the continent. So we believe that through such project-based approach the African scientists will be able to build the capacity, the capacity that they need by getting involved in this project and part participating in the life comprehensive uh, uh, project-based pipeline. So I think that is one way we'll be able to um, 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 build and train people uh, particularly. And of course, each genome sequencing effort will have a training and capacity building uh, 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 model tied to it. So which we aim that for the first genome being sequenced as Africa, we're able to deploy that framework in that in, uh, in in this in that uh, capacity building framework trainings and you know all other courses in that uh, sequencing model. So I think I can just take the second um, the other question. 
How have you started to consider use cases for the genomic data that will be made available by the project? So uh, yes, we've, we've started to consider use cases. So the first one is, I mentioned about the Africa Center for Disease Control. So we believe that hopefully, once we're able to sequence biodiversity genomes, that such data will be available to um, um, uh, health specialists, for instance, and other specialists in, across the continent to be able to make informed decision in terms of disease control using biodiversity management. So because we believe that uh, human interaction with the ecosystem is potentially, uh, basically potentially have significant impact as we've seen with COVID-19 and as well as um, Ebola uh, outbreak. So we need to begin to look at things from that biodiversity uh, 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 management side of things. Secondly, we also think that the data will contribute to the Africa Union into Africa Bureau for Animal Resources, you know, because they are mandated to uh, look at genetic resources across the continent. We also have the plant equivalent of such agency. So how do we begin to um, supply this data to, this, to these uh, agencies and particularly to the biobanks across the continent who would have the need to start um, uh, having more genetic data in the continent? So, and also at the local level, for instance, when you have a, a uh, when you have species like fish species, uh, Bostricus africanus, uh, which serve as a, as a food stuff uh, for for many communities across the Gulf of Guinea, how do you begin to improve the genetics of this species in order to maximize yield and ensure that this actually have impact to the local communities? So these are several use cases we've considered, and I think you can find them on the website um, at the moment. So I'm not sure if we we'll put that up there, but we, these are things we have already considered. Thank you very much, sir. And we appreciate uh, Dr. Thank God um, Ebenezer for that, um, for all those um, adequate answers. Please, we want to write about now move to the oral presentations. So if you are presenting from um, oral presentation five to eight, can you please deposit your presentation with the ICT? So I'll be calling on the first oral presenter, number five. We will be presenting implementation of standardized bioinformatics practices, pipelines, and data structures in SARS-CoV-2 sequencing at uh, Kamuzu University of Earth Sciences. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, uh, my name is Sami Gwai. Um, I am a lecturer at Ikamzu University of Earth Sciences. And uh, I'm here to present uh, on the title as shown on the screen. But first of all, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, the organizers and everyone for allowing me to be part of this. I hope you can hear me. Any feedback, please? Yes. Right, thank you. So um, this presentation basically is just to share what we have done uh, at Kamuzu University of Earth Sciences, trying to uh, improve on how we analyze SARS-CoV-2 uh, sequence data. So basically, I think as we all might be aware that since 2019, the world at large has been fighting uh, COVID-19, uh, uh, the virus uh, started uh, in Wuhan, China, and then it has been spreading to across the globe. And uh, it, uh, by this year, we know that uh, almost every country in Africa has been affected. But one thing that has been uh, coming out clear is that uh, genomic analysis of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, has contributed a lot to, in, to trying to respond to the pandemic. So. Different countries have taken up measures to try to control the pandemic by understanding what type of sequences they are, what type of lineages of the SARS-CoV-2 they have. But the challenge has been on the developing countries, uh, of which Malawi is just an example. Uh, the challenge has been uh, lack of the capacity. had to apply for 
sending from the phage object. So the main objective was uh, to develop a bioinformatics capability that can be able to generate high quality SARS-CoV-2 genomes and then to be able to analyze them effectively and then be able to inform uh, uh, the, the public of maybe what lineages do we have, uh, the difference introduction uh, lists that we have in the country, and then so that they should inform uh, maybe how they, the country respond. And the specific objectives were just to train bioinformaticians. So these are local bioinformaticians to train them on uh, pipeline development for the SARS-CoV-2 uh, sequence analysis, as well as to be able to generate a preference report uh, based on the outcome of uh, the tools that are used in bioinformatics. And then the other part was uh, to implement uh, a portable compute environment uh, locally, uh, that is within the Camus University of Earth Sciences, so that uh, when people want to do the analysis, they can easily do it uh, over the uh, server. Now, um, the method, so basically uh, about four bioinformaticians uh, were selected uh, together with one lead bioinformatician, uh, who is who was supposed to take the law of uh, training these other bioinformaticians on uh, implementation of the software and pipeline for the SARS-CoV-2 analysis. So this basically just involved uh, some weekly meetings uh, that were conducted where the four were being trained, uh, being led by the lead bioinformaticians on uh, software and content analyzation as well as uh, pipeline evaluation. So we had different different pipelines, which we had to go through them, analyze them, understand the input and the output, and then uh, try to understand the quality control. And then based on that, we should, with an aim of uh, selecting just one that we can implement on our local server. So we also worked on the low SARS-CoV-2 data that was generated at uh, one of the uh, uh, centers here. It's called Malawi River Welcome Trust. So we could use uh, fast five from Minion sequence as well as uh, first use from uh, the Illumina sequencing. So these were the data uh, sources. And then based on the, as the training was going, we could uh, work from uh, the raw data, trying to generate consistent sequences. And then once we have the consistent sequences, try to uh, classify them phylogenetically. And then after that, uh, generate previous report. So the classification was, ma was mainly done using the pangolin and the next grade tools. And then the prevalence reports were being generated um, using the, the R studio. So these were the main steps um, that helped uh, the, the bioinformaticians to be trained and then to be able to understand how the pipelines uh, work. Now, upon completion of this, I should say that this started in uh, July. So we worked from July up to last month. Uh, that's when we completed this part. So, Basically, from that, uh, what was uh, what was the output was that uh, upon reviewing of the different softwares, the Arctic pipeline was selected as the software that uh, we can easily uh, work on with it, and then it was uh, migrated onto our local server within the Kuhes, and then uh, the pipeline's protocol so was also developed. So this protocol uh, includes everything uh, from how do you uh, how, do you, how did we select the pipeline and then how did we implement it? So all the steps have been documented in the protocol uh, that is available. And then uh, the analysis, uh, the phylogenetic analysis was also successfully done. And uh, in the next slide, I'll just show an example of that. And then apart from that, we were able also to generate a preference uh, report for the SARS-CoV-2. So in the next slide, is just an example of uh, the reports that we're able to uh, generate. So uh, one figure has been labeled example of the prevalence uh, graph. So uh, maybe it might not be clear uh, there, but it is just trying to show that based on the output that we can have from the uh, the analysis pipeline, we could be able to classify to say which lineages uh, have been introduced in the country and when was it, and then uh, also the numbers, uh, the prevalence in a way. And then on the other part, it's just uh, trying to compare what we have locally to uh, what is circulating around the globe. So we use uh, the next grade to try to compare what we have, versus, uh, the sequence that we generated to those in the gen bank. So this is just an example of what the pipeline can do having undergone uh, the training. So apart, uh, the, the, the main thing that can come out of that we can get from here is that uh, 
Now, as a country, we have the capabilities to handle SARS-CoV-2 data as compared to the past, because previously we used to send our data to uh, South Africa. That's where the analysis was being done. But because of this project, uh, the training has been done. So we have the local bioinformaticians that have been trained and we have uh, the capacity. So this means that now we have reduced cost of data analysis, uh, as I mentioned already that previously it was being done outside. And then uh, the other thing, which is in a way uh, maybe a challenge because we have just managed to uh, migrate the, the, the computer environment within a local server. Our plan was to uh, implement it on the cloud, like the Amazon, but uh, we have noted uh, just this, uh, that it's a little bit expensive, but we're working on it to see how best can we do it? Because otherwise it would be better if it were on the Amazon uh, crowd. So this training has been a success, but then we look at some uh, limitations or recommendations to say that we need more staff to be trained. As I mentioned, it's just for my informaticians that have been trained. Uh, so we need more, and then we need that also the pipeline be implemented on other institution, and then we plan to work in collaboration with the ministry to scale up the bioinformatics structure and pipeline so that, uh, we can use it at a national uh, level. Yeah, so that's uh, pretty it. Just acknowledgement that uh, these, as you, uh, as you can see from the screen, are just members of the team that we've been working together. And then this project, uh, the abstract is just part of the main project that we are doing that is funded by uh, the Public Health Alliance for Genomic Epidemiology, uh, FEDGE. So thank you so much. Um, be glad to take some questions. Uh, thank you. All right, thank you, Samuel, for keeping to time. Questions and comments, observations, others. Do we have one or two from the chat? Can you please check? All right, thank you. Um... Let me see. No, I can't access them from here. I don't know. If, I think they were for the previous presenter, I think. Okay, we have one. Mm -hmm. Yep. Under your resort presentation, you only mentioned that uh, you were successful. And we could only see one or two charts on the phylogenetic tree. What are your results and the implications of your result to this uh, work and the rele relevance of your work to the society? Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for that. So um, since this was uh, most like a training sort of, uh, those two charts were just to show that uh, we, are, we are able, uh, as the bioinformaticians that have been trained, we were able to generate that. but. Uh, what I should say that that is of important is that now we have the uh, the computer the portable environment uh, computer environment within the QHES such that now from now uh, if we we do the sequences uh, for example we're doing it locally we will no longer be able to uh, we'll no longer be sending them to South Africa but we'll be doing them locally so those just were just to illustrate that uh, we we are able to move from uh, the raw data all the way to reporting but. Uh, they were not like uh, maybe the actual uh, actual results. For the main result for this is that we have a portable computer environment that is up and running now on our local server, and then we have trained uh, staff that can uh, uh, effectively handle the analysis all the way from low data up to generating a prevalence report. So this is good news to our country, as I mentioned, because now we no longer need to send our samples to South Africa, but we can do it locally. Thank you for that. Thank you, Samuel. So at this point, I'll be inviting Dr. Shuremeka. Thank you very much. Yeah, just uh, a brief information to the oral presenters. You have eight minutes for your presentation and then two minutes for questions and answers. Yeah, so the next presenter is uh, Chisom Shuremeka and she'll be presenting uh, multivariate genome-wide association analysis reviews novel loci associated with liver enzyme traits in African population. Uh, Chisholm Shermekun, if you're ready, share your screen. Thank you.
Good day, everyone. My name is Chisom Shoremekun, a PhD student at Macquarie University, Uganda. I'll be presenting my research titled Multivariant GWAS Analysis Reviews Associated Loci Implicated in Liver Enzymes of Continental African Population. I'll be using this outline during this presentation. The liver, which is the largest solid organ in the body, is responsible for vital functions necessary for healthy living. The liver is responsible for the removal of toxins and poisonous substances from the blood. They also maintain healthy blood sugar level by storing excess glucose as glycogen. Therefore, liver disease causes liver damage and exposes the body to harmful substances. This disease has been found to be to contribute greatly to mortality and morbidity rate globally. It has been found to cause approximately 2 million deaths every year. Factors such as gender, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status have been found to be associated with the risk of liver disease and its prevalence. A vital screening tool which can be used to detect hepatic dysfunction and hence Timely intervention of liver disease is known as liver function tests. This is done by assessing the level of liver enzymes in the blood. These enzymes include aspartate aminotransferase, AST, alanine aminotransferase, ALT, alkaline phosphatase, ALP, gamma glutamate transferase, GGT, albumin, and total bilirubin. Several factors are associated with plasma level of these enzymes in individuals, such as the genetic and the environmental factors. The chances of inheriting liver enzyme concentration level has been observed to range from 22 to 66%. This signifies the role of genetics in LFT result interpretation. The Genome-Wide Association Study, also known as GWAS, is a statistical approach used to detect association between common genetic variants and disease traits in sample from different population. The multivariant GWAS analysis is a type of analysis that involves the joint analysis of the potentially correlated traits. This has been discovered to be more beneficial because there is an increase in power when genetically correlated traits are being analyzed. And this brings me to the objective of this study. The aim of this study is to identify genetic variants that are associated with liver enzyme concentration in African population using a multivariate GWAS approach. This is a GWAS replication study. We have the discovery cohort and also the replication cohort. The replication cohort is used to validate any association uncovered in the discovery cohort. The discovery cohort are made up of the 6,407 participants from the Ugandan Genome Resource Study. And the replication cohort includes the 2,707 participants known as the South African Zulu cohort. These participants are a combination of two studies, the Durban Diabetes Studies and the Durban Case Control Study from South Africa. Biological parameters, which includes the listed liver enzymes from the raw genotype and imputed data, were utilized for multivariant mixed model GWAS analysis, which is implemented in GEMA. These analyses were followed by the regional plot and the functional annotation using local zoom and verb, respectively. Table one shows the descriptive statistics of the Ugandan Genome Resource and the South African Zulu cohort. The average age in UGR and SAZ at 34 and 49, respectively. Both population recorded a higher percentage of female participants than male participants. Aside from GGT, the average LFT parameter in UGR are higher than that of the South African Zulu cohort. Figure four shows the Manhattan plot of both the discovery and the replication cohorts. The Manhattan plot is a scatter plot that shows the statistical association of SNPs and phenotypes, in this case, liver enzymes. On the y-axis is the negative logarithm to base 10 of the p-values of the SNPs, and on the x-axis are the chromosomes. The red horizontal line represents a threshold at which every, 
uh, every snip on this or above it is said to be significantly associated with the phenotype. Table two shows the, sum shows the summary of the multivariate linear mixed model GWAS analysis. After the analysis, the number of SNPs significantly associated with liver enzymes were 59 out of approximately 20 million SNPs at a p-value of five times 10 raised to power minus eight. We further checked which of these 59 SNPs were replicated in the South African Zulu cohort, and we discovered that only 13 SNPs out of the 59 SNPs were replicated at a p-value of five times 10 raised to power minus two. Considering the fact that these 13 SNPs might be in linkage disequilibrium with each other, we clumped them, we clumped the region using a distance of 500 kb upstream and downstream of the lead SNP. After clumping, only two SNPs out of the 13 SNPs were found to be independent of each other, signifying two loci. Table three shows the summary of the replicated loci. The first locus is the RHPN1, which is located on the chromosome 8, with a p-value of 4.79 times 10 raised to the power minus 9. And the second locus is the LGS11, which is located on the chromosome 16, with a p-value of 5.234 times 10 raised to the power minus 8. Both of these names are intron variants. Figure 5 shows the KQ plot of the discovery cohort and also the replication cohort. Figure 6 shows the local zoom plot of the two replicated loci. The purple diamond, which is in the red circle, indicates the replicated SNP. The surrounding SNPs are color-coded according to the level of linkage disequilibrium with the lead SNP. The higher the, the, the R-square value of the surrounding SNPs, the stronger the linkage disequilibrium with the lead SNPs, and the higher the probability of them being causal. In plot a, the surrounding SNPs have a low R square, indicating the lower chances of them being the causal SNPs and the higher chances of the lead SNP being the causal SNP. This is because they have a weak leakage disequilibrium with the lead SNP. Why in plot B, the surrounding SNPs have some SNPs that have high R square. This indicates a higher chances of them being the causal SNP and the lower chances of the lead SNP being the causal SNP because they are in high linkage disequilibrium with the lead SNP. The multivariant GWAS analysis of the liver enzymes in African population reveals two independent SNPs. We identified and validated a novel signal at a not previously reported loci and a distant association signal at a known locus, the LGS11. The RHPN1 and the LGS11 are protein coding, coding genes known to be associated with blood osmolarity and bilirubin measurements, respectively. These SNPs should be explored to understand the etiology of liver disease in Africa and other populations. In conclusion, this is the first multivariant GWAS of liver enzymes in Africa. SNPs associated with liver enzymes in the Ugandan population were replicated in the South African population. These results demonstrate the value of performing GWAS in continental Africa, and it can provide an opportunity to gain further insight into the genetic architecture of liver enzymes. These are some of my references. Acknowledgement. I would like to acknowledge every member of the African Computational Genomics Research Group for their contribution towards the success of this study. I would also like to acknowledge the Center for Genomics Research and Innovation, CGRI and NABDA, for their continuous support, and also the, the MBGN for, their, for the opportunity to present this work. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So we have two minutes for questions. So we have somebody. Yeah, thank you very much, Isum. I thought that was a very beautiful presentation and great job. And I feel like I should put my hands together for you once again. Um, so quick one, um, just an addition to what you are doing. Um, I, I suggest that you change you, um, what you are calling liver enzyme to liver function biomarkers. Uh, because as a matter of fact, believe it is not an enzyme. Right. Um, what's the other one that you did out of the six of them? There are two that are not the enzymes. Albumin, the, the albumin. Yeah, the albumin, the protein, those are not enzymes, right? So 
Uh, but I do understand that they are liver function biomarkers, and that's what they are called. So I would suggest you just change it to liver function biomarkers. And uh, so the question is, and so what? What does it mean? <laughs> At the end of the day, um, you find two SNPs. Uh, to me, who I'm just a layman on the street. Uh, can you just tell us what it means at the end of it? Does it mean that because of those SNPs, those biomarkers are high and does it mean that there, are, there is a disease? You get what I mean? Uh, or it means there is a disease. Because if the SNP increases the biomarker naturally, is the baseline or reference point that we're using for Africa, which I know was not developed uh, in, for Africans in any way, I, does that mean that we should change it and look for something that is uh, more relevant to us? Uh, I don't know whether you get what I'm trying to ask. Okay, um, if I get you, thank you very much. Um, the SNPs that have been discovered, these are single nucleotide polymorphism, which are common in people that have this um, that is associated with these liver enzymes in the African population. This means that this um, further research is needed to check to, to like further research are needed to check these particular SNPs. We can also compare them to that of other population, but by the time we check them, we know if they are common with the liver enzymes, with, with the liver enzyme concentration, because the SNPs are, if they are common in this pop, in two different population, that means is a signal that they are very important in the concentration of these liver biomarkers, like we said. So the that means the further um, we need to further studies are needed to ascertain the to ascertain the the uh, I don't know if I'm answering your question, sir. Yeah, not really. I'm just wondering. So it doesn't mean that there's a disease. Is that what you're saying? Okay, the the concentration the disease comes in um when you evaluate it, when you compare it to the concentration of these liver enzymes, when the liver enzyme concentrations are abnormal, that means that there is a disease. But you know that there's a SNP that is driving that high level. I'm just yeah. I understand, trying to bring out the clinical implication. Does that mean that if I have the SNP, and because of the SNP, uh, my liver enzyme is high, Yes, that's the association. So if you have if you have that single nucleotide polymorphism, that means that there is association between that particular polymorphism and the concentration of that liver enzyme. So people that have this um people that have this um SNP should um um people that have this particular SNP should be tested to or should be on the watch out for any development of the liver disease which can come up as a result of increase in the liver enzymes in the liver enzymes concentration yeah thank you You're thank you for your beautiful presentation the liver enzymes AATST, GGT uh, has been, they've been found to be heritable. That is, they have uh, inheritance. But some studies have discovered that these genes vary between the two sexes, male and female. Do you take that into consideration in your study? Thank you very much, sir. Um, yes, the concentration of the liver enzymes and um, liver enzymes concentration have been found to vary between gender. So during our MVLMM analysis, they um, we adjusted for the sex of the particle um, of the of the individuals that participated in this study. They are um, called the co-founders. The sex is the co-founders. So they are taken into consideration and they are adjusted for during our MVLMM analysis. And is there any difference between the two sexes? There is a between the two sexes for the male and female samples. And um, what the what the adjustment did was to just assume like like to level up the gender. So everything is, the gender is being factored in in the analysis. So at the end of the day, we are considering the whole 
population as a whole and not the male or female gender. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chisum, for the presentation. I think we'll be going on for the next uh, presentation and then I think Chisum will be available if she has. Okay, you have a question. All right, so just to uh, buttress what uh, the last question, we, if there were differences between the sexes and all those things. Yeah, so during the analysis, I think one of the things that they did was to adjust for sex. So when you're adjusting for sex or you're adjusting for population, like you're trying to not discriminate between your studies such that you don't want anything to affect your studies. So you are just for sex, you are just for age, and you are just for all those things. So whatever you get is independent of the sex. So the associations that are driving that trait are not uh, particularly influenced by the sex or the age. And the answer, okay, yeah, I think that would be the all. So we'll go for the next. Yeah. So, Dr. Lani, okay. Thank you very much for your attention. We'll move straight to the next presenter. Um, or our presentation seven. Genome wide association. Genome wide association study of preliminary function in Europeans and Africans from the UK Bio Bank identified identifies distinct um, variants. Or representation seven is it online or? Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Anyone? Yes, we hear you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I will be giving you a talk entitled uh, Genome-Wide Assertion Study of Primary Function in Europeans and Africans from the UK Biobank identifies distinct variants. So my bandwidth isn't that good. Uh, so if I turn on my video, it may end up uh, spoiling the presentation. So my name is Amsala Sinkala, I'm uh, from the Institute of Infectious Disease and Molecular Medicine. So for this presentation, I'll start by giving an overview on the data sets that we used. Uh, we got these data sets from the UK Biobank, which is a biomedical data repository of health information of over a half million participants. And we were interested in primary function parameters and the genotype arrays of uh, over 3,000 Africans and about 470,000 Europeans. So the primary function parameters that we looked at include the first vital capacity, the first expiratory volume in one second, and the peak expiratory flow rate. And these parameters are measured using a spirometer, and they are indicators of respiratory health and the general well-being of an individual. So to start with, we decided to compare the mean differences in these lung function parameters between individuals of European and African ancestries. And we found that all the three parameters were significantly higher in those individuals of European ancestry than the Africans. And since these three, Land function parameter values were significantly higher in Europeans than in Africans. We decided to perform a genome wide assertion analysis to identify the genetic variants associated with each of these land function parameters 
within each group. And as you can see here is the Manhattan plot for the FEV1 in Europeans and Manhattan plot for the FEV1 in Africans. And we identified 108 SNPs in Africans and 100 and 488 SNPs in Europeans. And as you can see, surprisingly, we found no overlap between the two sets of SNPs. We also conducted a genome-wide association analysis for the FVC. Again, we identified 144 SNPs in Africans and 444 SNPs in Europeans, but no overlap. And the same goes for the PEF, where we identified 60 SNPs in Africans and 288 SNPs in Europeans, but again, with no overlap. Conversely, when we compared these SNPs within each ancestral group, we found that these SNPs exhibit a significant overlap within the group. As can be seen here, we found uh, 777 unique SNPs with a significant overlap between the three lung function parameters in Europeans and 200 unique SNPs for the African population with a significant overlap among the SNPs. And so uh, next we decided to perform some enrichment analysis. Here for each ancestral group, we assess the enrichment of GWAS catalog annotation terms of the genes in which the SNPs are shared with pulmonary function occur. So for this enrichment analysis, uh, we found that there was enrichment for various terms which are related to pulmonary function for both sets of genes, despite the SNPs being different in the two sets of populations. And so we decided uh, to identify the previously described and novel SNPs among the significant SNPs that we identified, that is from the 777 SNPs in Europeans and the 200 SNPs in Africans, we found that in Africans, no SNPs have been previously reported as shared with pulmonary function, whereas 105 have been previously reported in Europeans. And we found that again, no SNPs have been reported to be related to pulmonary function associated traits in Africans, whereas 200 of those, the SNPs that we identified have been previously reported from various GWAS studies. And among the SNPs that were identified in Africans, we found that 44 of those have been reported as shared with a certain lung function tests or diseases such as asthma. Overall, we identified 156 novel SNPs in Africans and 360 SNPs in Europeans. And since none of the SNPs that we identified are shared with pulmonary function among African literature, we queried the GWAS catalog for previous studies of pulmonary function or phenotypes related to pulmonary function, such as asthma or lung cancer, across the ancestral groups. And this is what we found. So over the years, we can see that uh, the number of studies which, which have been conducted on individual individuals of African ancestry only are only a few. I can tell you that the value there is eight. Whereas the number of studies conducted on, on individuals of European ancestry are 120. And when you look at this uh, from a different perspective in terms of the cumulative sample size of these studies, we find that uh, for studies conducted on Europeans only, the cumulative sample size as of three weeks ago was over 20, 10 million. Whereas for those studies which have been conducted on individuals of African ancestry only, the cumulative sample size is just over 45,000. So our findings here, we believe that they offer a better understanding of the different variants that modify pulmonary function in Africans and Europeans, which is a significant finding for future GWAS studies and medicine. And furthermore, our analysis of the studies of pulmonary phenotypes show that individuals of European ancestry are disproportionately 
overrepresented compared to Africans with the gap ever so widening over the years, despite there being uh, a number of studies which are now being conducted on individuals of African ancestry. I'd like to acknowledge uh, Professor Nicola Moda and the people that I worked with on this project, Sama and Mamana, my funders, HP Bionate, and the people within our group, the Computation Biology Group at UCT. Thank you very much. And I will take some questions now. Thank you very much. Questions, observations, and comments. Thank you very much, Musalula, for that presentation. I have a question, I have a comment. So my question goes like this. During the course of your presentation, I was expecting to see like a flow chart of your methodology. All I saw was, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. It was just the, um, the population where you derived your population, your data set from. I didn't actually see, I don't know if you did a univariant GWAS, a multivariant GWAS, a meta analysis. I don't know if you actually um, um, did a joint analysis of a phenotype of interest. I would love you to clarify that. And on comment, for the comment, I would love to like, I will say that the reason for the um, large disparity of your result is as a result of your data because more um, data was derived from the European population while a lesser number was used for your African population. The difference in the, um, the number is quite large. So that's why most times when we see the result is most often, we don't actually see result for African population because of the number of data sets you use for Africa. Thank you. So thank you very much for the questions and comments. So in terms of the flow chart, uh, maybe I'm going to include that in the next presentation so that people can follow easily. As for the sample sizes, yes, they are different, but by statistical chance alone, we expect that even if the sample sizes are different, you should expect a certain overlap between the results. Uh, even if, uh, let's say, we were to run a simulation and keep changing the sample sizes of a particular large sample, we'd see a significant overlap in the significant SNPs as the sample sizes increase. And what we found is quite intriguing because we found that there are no SNPs that were common between the two populations, despite the SNPs being associated with lung, the genes in which the SNPs occur being associated with lung function. Uh, parameters or phenotypes related to lung function. Thank you very much, Musa Lun. I've forgotten your first question. My first question is, did you perform a univariant GWAS or a multivariant GWAS? So it wasn't a multivariant GWAS. We decided to perform a univariant GWAS for each uh, phenotype and then we combine the SNPs. Okay. Again, there are studies which uh, encourage that type of a GWAS. They say that it's, it's more likely to yield uh, SNPs that are more relevant to the phenotype, similar to what the previous uh, presenter was talking about, but it's a different approach. Thank you. Another question for you. Okay. Thank you for your presentation. I just have a question. I don't know if you bother to find out why there was a variation in your results based on the fact that you compared the African population and the, the European population. So is there any particular reason? Could it be environmental or what? Uh, since we are looking at the SNPs, or are you talking about the SNPs or the lung function? parameters in this case? The SNPs. For the SNPs, uh, since we are looking at the SNPs, I, I, I don't think it can be environmental. I think it's related to the ancestry of the individuals. In fact, uh, we also looked at the frequencies of most of the SNPs and we found that they vary greatly between the two populations. There are some SNPs which are 
predominantly more frequent in Africans than Europeans and vice versa. Okay, the third question. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. So uh, I find the number of novel SNPs really high. Uh, maybe you could just hint on your clamping distance, uh, which clamping distance do you use? And then, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, in, in your methodology. So the other one is, uh, so in future, it's just a comment. In future, maybe you could think of uh, doing a meta-analysis and you include your results. Uh, so it's just like you get a dual summary statistics from other people that have the same, and then you meta-analyze them. So it's like you're combining all those studies into one. And then you see if the novelty that you found out here still stands or it goes down. So that could solve the bias that people are asking you about of, of a few numbers in, in the Africans that are in the UK Biobank. Thank you. Okay, so for the Africans that are represented in the UK Biobank, it turns out that there are no other studies that particularly look, uh, have looked at lung function parameters in Africans. So it's not possible to perform a meta-analysis and get those uh, SNPs. You can probably find some on asthma, on lung cancer and things like that, but not particularly on lung function parameters like uh, forced expiratory volume. And then for the European population, the UK Biobank has the largest population of individuals, probably uh, compared to any other studies that have looked at FVC or, the, or, or all those lung function parameters, you can combine the data sets and they wouldn't match the um, number of individuals that are present in the UK Biobank. And maybe that's why we are picking up a lot more sleeps when we use the data sets from the UK Biobank. And like those which have been previously reported in the literature where maybe the sample sizes range from a thousand maybe to 5,000 individuals in each of those studies. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Shuremi. Yeah, thank you. So we're going to the next uh, presentation. And the next presenter is, uh, I'm just picked up. Uh, yeah, Ijeoma Ashilebo uh, will be presenting computational modeling of. Uh, migration of single fibroblast cells in 3D chemical gradients. Um, good, good, uh, good morning, everyone. Can you see my screen? And can you hear me? So we can see. All right. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Asili Boijama Charity. My work is going to be a slight di um, diversion from what we've been talking about um, from the beginning of the conference. Um, I'm going to be talking about computational modeling of single cell fibroblast migration in response to three dimensional chemical gradients. Um, to keep to time, I might skim over some slides at the end. If there are any questions, please let me know. All right, cell migration is a very important is a very important um, physiological process and it can broadly be divided into two. We could have single cell migration or collective cell migration that are very important in different um, cellular processes as the case may be. For my research, um, which is um, part of what I did for my master's, uh, I'm going to be talking about the migration of single fibroblast cells, which is the type of, um, which is the most important um, collective um, tissue cells that um, take part in providing a structural framework for organs and tissues to exist in. They, they are important in the production of collagen and the extracellular matrices, which um, provide 
a framework that um, that pre that preserves the structure of um, or the integrity of tissues, as we know, the effect of we could have studied migration due to moisture, electric electric field, physical contact. But for my work, we work, we did um, study migration due to the availability or presence of chemical factor in a cellular microenvironment. The chemical tax is simply describes the movement of cells or organisms in a directed manner towards or away from the source of a um, chemical secretion. And um, in this, in this um, um, brief GIF, you can see that even though there seems to be stochasticity in the migration of the cells, at the end, they come down, it all boils down to the movement towards the chemical factor. As I mentioned just now, it could be towards or away from the um, chemical factor which um, is in place. And but for this, um, this experiment, experimental setup, I'm going to be describing migration of fibroblast cells um, towards the chemical attractant, um, which is the platelet derived growth factor. It's important that we study fibroblast cells because they take part, they play a very major role in wound healing and um, other pathological um, conditions such as cancers or excessive proliferation like um, that give rise to um, tumors or as the case may be. And more, most importantly, their major function is the production of extracellular matrices that um, provide structure and a framework for the cells to um, for tissues to exist in. PDGF plays a, plays a very important role in, in the body. It's, it serves as, as a pool to draw in um, cells towards itself or in the case of the wound healing and also participates in cell proliferation and differentiation. So it's important for us to study this, um, these factors. And um, in vivo experimental setups are very expensive and um, we are trying to bridge the gap between in vitro and in vivo. So for the experimental setups that we, that gave rise to this um, computational work, um, microfluidic devices that are mimetic of um, in vivo conditions were used to set up these experiments. And we, the, um, Computer biologist, or in this case, biomedical engineer, experiment from an engineering or mathematical point of view. To do this, we needed a computational model that simulates the migration of the cells in a three dimensional um, ECM environment. And of course, with the chemical factor in place. And then we explored the division of the growth factor. And we also refined the models. Um, using multi-parametric analysis. And this, all the simulations was carried out in physics cell, um, cell software, which is a, which can, which creates a um, multi-mechanistic platform that we can add a lot of conditions and study how they interrelate and try to recreate what we observed in the environmental, in, excuse me, in the experimental or in some cases in the in vivo setup. Uh, I might skip over some slides to maintain, to um, ensure that I keep the time. Also, we try to understand how the position, the initial position of the chemical factor um, as regards to the cell affects the velocity or the speed with which the cells migrated to um, the point where it's needed. Imagine a case where there's an injury um, the cells are closer to the um, point, um, point of the injury. Do they migrate faster or do the ones that are further away migrate faster? These are the dynamics we're trying to monitor. And to do this, we observed how far the cells migrated from their initial positions, taking the um, taking the distance in micrometer every 24 hours for four days. So the real system we should try to simulate, we, first of all, they performed the experiments and um, got the experimental results. And for my work, we try to make a model, we model different aspects um, individually, the microenvironment, the extracellular matrices, the cells itself, the interactions with each other and all that. And then we model the whole system, we perform simulations. And then from the results we obtained, we, we predicted, okay, this is what is happening. This is what is happening. And then 
um, we are still in the process of trying to create the final model. So we are still fine tuning. And this is a disclaimer that this is not the final result. This is not where we are hoping to get to finally, but this is a movement in the right direction. So the microfluidic devices that I, I was describing and the, text con and the test conditions, the cells placed here, the cells were placed um, originally at this point. And then for cases where the chemical factor was placed close to the cells, it was placed in this channel. And for cases where the chemical factor was placed further away, it was placed in the, in the blue channel. I don't know if you can see my mouse, in the blue channel. So we spaced the cells to see how each of them migrated and to observe the dynamics and the stochasticity with which they migrated. All right, so we have the control condition and then of course the chemical factor close to the cell and the chemical factor further away from the cell. To do this, we need to, to do this, we need to create a biochemical microenvironment to simulate the interaction of cells with each other, to create like a force, a, a force um, potential between of the cells interacting with each other and with their environment. And we also needed clear metrics to measure, to compare what we observed in the simulation with um, experimental results, which was the measurement of the um, distances covered by the cells with regards to time. This was implemented with the physical cell software that was able to help us solve for the microenvironment and the mechanistic, that's the movement of the cells, the displacement of the cells from time to time. And we also initialized some um, para motility parameters in the group. And this was done by, by um, fixing different time steps based on um, literature and the, what you observed in the lab during the experimental setup of how fast cell moves or how quickly the chemical factor dispersed in the environment and created the three-dimensional um, environment, environmental dispersal area kind of. And then also how the interaction, the timelines, these timelines and the force fields, uh, the force um, based potential functions that we implemented in the model enabled us to recreate this, the experimental sector. I'm not going to bore you with all these mathematical jargons, but these are the um, formulas that the software was solving behind the scene to create the biochemical microenvironment to solve for the cell me um, mechanics and mo motion, the forces, the displacement, the interactions with each other and all that. And then the cell basement membrane, because the cells um, start from an initial position and um, interact with some forces to displace themselves or to move from one point to another. Okay, the motility parameters that was implemented in the group was um, the most important ones were the um, forward motility um, bias that sets the degree to which the cells move forward or backward. For the, for the control conditions, it was set at 50%, which was um, there's an equal possibility that the cells move forward and backward. That's, there's no there is no um, in quote favoritism between um, the directions that the cells could migrate towards. And then for the lateral restrictions, the more, um, the further away the chemical factors are, the more um, lateral, the, the, redu the more reduced the lateral restric restrictions to allow for more, um, for more migration for higher distances to be covered. So we initialized this um, framework by placing the cells, as I said, at some distances from each other and then initializing the motility parameters and allowing the software to crunch these formulas behind the scenes. These are the values of the initial parameters that were implemented. Okay, and these are the concentrations that we worked with from the experimental set of the collagen at 2.5 microgram per mil, the PDGF at um, five um, nanogram per mil, and three cells per simulation, as I said before, to observe um, the stochasticity or the directedness of migration. Um, so far, we've been able to, we're not at the end point yet, but we've been able to of um, the PDGF from the original placement um, towards the cells and towards the environments where the cells are placed. So after 24 hours, 48 hours, and so on, to the last day, to 94 hours. So we're able to accurately predict 
and then model what it would look like in the experimental setup. This was um, in this is actually confirmed by what we saw in the experiments and from literature. Um, as I said before, the motility parameters that we implemented for example, for the forward motility biases, it was 50-50 such that the cells were as likely to move forward as they were to move backward. But for the same channel and the opposite channel um, conditions, we, we increased it to account for the presence of the PDGF in the microenvironment. And these were some of the other um, motility parameters I can't test it on now because of time. Also, the simulation results we visualize as a box plot um, such that where the notches interlap, we can see that there is a there is a close um, there is a closer relatedness or um, a more accurate prediction. And we we have been so far actually been able to predict for twenty four hours, that six hours and. Um, excuse me, for the second day, third day, and the fourth day. But for the first day, we are still working on that. That shows that the um, experiment is not perfect yet. And then for the same channel condition, for the first day, the third day, and the, for the first day and the third day, we already have accurate or semi-accurate results. And then we are working on the second day and the fourth day. Um, and then also for the opposite channel, we have more accurate results for the second day and the, and kind of for the fourth day, but we are still working on creating um, not exact, but very close and um, very close um, simulation, simulation results to what we have in the experimental setup. And the effective velocities, um, we can see that this is in agreement with what we observed in the experiment for the same channels, it was increased um, in relation to the control conditions and then for the opposite channels, the cells moved faster. This shows that um, placing the chemical factor or for the cells that are close, that are conditional in the experimental setup, the cells migrated that will be located farther away from the initial position of the chemical factors, they migrated faster, probably due to the distances and then the way the chemical gradient is formed, there's a higher concentration farther away, so they migrate towards the higher concentration. But when it's closer, there's a lower concentration, um, there's a um, higher concentration close by, so it's, it kind of stays around where the higher concentration is found. Um, this is the experimental results. Um, it's about to be published now. And then we see that for the control condition, this is for the 24 hours and for the final day, for the control condition, the cells migrated into the matrix ball, into the simulation of the matrix ball, not um, further, like not as far as in the, in the same channel condition where they migrate, we can see that they migrated further. But for, for the opposite channel condition, the cells much further than in the same cell, um, in the same channel condition. And these are the simulation results. Um, we see that this is in agreement with what we have in the experiment. For the control condition, they are dispersed, but not as much as in the um, same channel condition. And then we see that further along in the opposite channel condition, we have cells that migrated much further and are dispersed more. And the lateral channel um, implementation, we could we can see how the stochasticity of at which, with which the cells migrated, as in with time, for the control condition, they were able to move more stochastically. And same for the same channel condition, they, are, they were just as likely to move in the lateral direction. They were just as likely to move in the lateral direction as they were to move in the direction we want them to move towards. So, but for the opposite channel, it's more controlled. It's more, um, it's less stochastic. This can also be visualized by observing the trajectories with which the cells migrated in the control condition. You can see it's highly stochastic. The cells are close to the initial point and you can't account for how far along the cells will go. And this stochasticity is observed in the other two conditions, but the final, the final point um, of, the cell, of the cell location and the level of stochasticity was reduced. We see that even though it seemed like they were migrating stochastically, um, it was more intentional, it was more directed. Yes, sorry, Ijeoma. 
migration pattern was more definitive. Yeah, so please yeah. uh, just run off yeah. you, more than 10 minutes. All right. Okay. We try to understand why this was, and uh, as I explained before, the way the chemical gradient is um, arranged um, for cells in the opposite channel. Once they divide, they move further, they move to, um, towards the high concentration, and then for cells in the same channel, they move. The because of the high concentration around them, they are more likely to stay closer to the high concentration. All right. Yeah. In conclusion, we were able to um, recreate. Um, um, the migration of cells in a three-dimensional microenvironment in response to chemical factors. And in future, we hope to um, extend the model and include more Bayesian um, platforms. Um, I would like to thank the people I worked with, my professor, my supervisors, and um, the PhD students that assisted me to both create the um, first based um, formulas and all that. Thank you. I welcome your questions now. Sorry for taking up time, I'm so sorry. Yeah, thank you very much. You spent quite a lot of time and uh, I don't think we'll be having any question from you. So if you have a question, you could just drop it uh, for Joma and then she'll take it on Zoom, yeah. So for the final presentation before we go for uh, for tea break uh, is Frank Abimbola Ogundoli. who will be presenting in silico insights and structural analysis of a novel cellulose gene of bacillus lichesone strain FAO obtained from Coco Podways. Thank you. No? Number So slide please. Now I will be speaking on in silico insights of cellulose gene obtained from bacillus like eriformis, which happens to be a gram-positive um, bacteria that is obtained from cocopod waste, which is a waste that is common in um, West Africa, or majorly every NGBN conference, yes. Okay, thank you very much. So, by the way of introduction, my name is Frank Abimbola Ogundolier, and um, I will be presenting again in silico insight and structural analysis of a novel cellulase gene, C cell A of bacillus like aliformins, strain FAO.CP7, obtained from cocoa pod waste. Cellulase is an important enzyme that catalyzes the activity at uh, the action of beta 1 4 glycosidic linkages. Now, cellulase as a piece belongs to a group of family that contains at least three different enzymes. We have the beta, uh, we have the endoglucanase, we have the uh, exoglucanase, and as well, we have lastly. Slide, please. Lastly, we have the enzyme for glucohydrosylase. Okay. This enzyme belongs to the carbohydrate active family, which we call the Cassie family. And it's very important in, major, in many industries, from ranging from the textile industry, the detergent industry, the biofuel industry for uh, releasing more of the glucose for fermentation in order to get bioethanol in the medical industry, in animal feeds for increasing digestibility, in solvent industry for, for producing chemicals, among others. Despite the COVID-19 lockdown, despite everything that happened in 2020, the, market, the global market value of cellulase still stands around 1.8 six billion US dollars, which shows that this enzyme is of great importance in the industry. Hence, there is great research. There's more research into producing these enzymes from different means in order to meet up for industrial need. 
Normally, the ability of wide microorganisms to produce this enzyme is limited because naturally, microorganisms produce for their own personal need. But interestingly, in order to get these enzymes for industrial use, there has been different processes that has been taking place over the world for the past few decades, such as optimization of production parameters, effect of pH, effect of temperature, effect of substrate concentration and, every, and other things, along as strain improvement, either through point mutagenesis or site directed mutagenesis, or either any other form of strain improvement. But recently, the use of recombinant DNA technology has actually given a promising hint to this challenge, which is true cloning and gene expression. But despite this uh, promising challenge, uh, despite these promises, in order to express the homologous genes, there is still challenges, which is attributed to insoluble bodies and um, production of misfolding uh, for dead proteins. Now, these proteins also can be obtained from different sources, microorganism, plants, and animal. For the sake of this uh, presentation, I'll be talking more on the microorganism because the microorganism produces it more, and it's more easy to manipulate to get more heat, unlike plant and animal, which is stressful to do. The aims and objective of this uh, study is to determine the sequence of cell aging from uh, bacillus like coliformis locally isolated from cocopod to genetically modify the gene for extracellular production in E. coli to clone and to clone the gene and model the deduced amino acids and lastly to molecularly characterize the protein. Now the, this is the workflow. The first thing is to isolate and molecularly identify the microorganism then extract the genomic DNA alongside its design primers, amplify, then later optimize restriction, digestion, ligation, and transformation, which are processes in gene cloning um, protocols, which I will not be bogging us with today. Coronary PCR and plasmid isolation, when the plasma sequencing using T7 promoter primers and the sequence analysis and structural studies, which is the major focus. And in order to do this, there are several uh, servers that are being used. Integrated DNA technology for primers uh, design, BLAST N, BLAST B from NCB High, XPC, which is a server uh, for using amino acids, uh, Signal P um, server for determining the nucleus, this uh, signal peptide sequence for the particular gene of interest. The Gino compiler, it's compiler to um, in silico uh, character, in, in silico design of the cloning process. The bio edit, using bio to uh, align or edit the sequence, the raw sequence, once it gets back from the sequencer, then the handle EMBA high cluster W for multiple sequence alignments, the protein data bank, the mega X, three versus model, primo, pro check for Ramachandra, um, the scope prediction and the transmembrane prediction too. Now, the primers used for this study, we have three sets of primers. The first primer is for the initial amplification. The next set of primer that contains a, a red tag, which is actually for the, the cloning process with the underlying parts, which is the restriction enzyme that are being introduced. And the last uh, part is the T7 promoter primers, which is used for Now, also in the results, we have uh, a graph showing the prediction. Normally, in gram positive organisms, there is a challenge when you are cloning a gram positive gene or a karyotic gene in a gram negative medium. And the challenge is localization of proteins. Normally, proteins, when produced, they are always translocated to the sites of need. And when they are doing this, they need a sequence. Oh, of amino acids, which actually lead to the specific site. And this sequence is called the signal peptide sequence. If you are cloning a gram-positive gene that has a signal peptide sequence that is meant for gram-positive medium in a gram-negative gene, the cell membrane will naturally not allow translocation 
of the protein. So what you have to do, the first thing is to find where the location is for the signal peptide. And on the graph, we have a point where we have a C cut, the first green uh, dotted line, which signified using the signal, which signified the exact cut for the particular amino acid sequence. Now the primer is, was designed to amplify right from the next amino acid from that particular cut. Now using a genome compiler, the the amplified gene is was uh, com uh, was computationally analyzed to understand how it's going to look like. Now after amplification, using a T7 polymer a T7 promoter gene sequence, the gene that codes was amplified. Oh. And we have different color annotations on the gene sequence, which actually shows different uh, important um, checkpoints in the plasmids. We have the green bar at, at the lower hand, which is the histidine tag for the purification. We have the yellow uh, highlighted section, which is actually meant for the restriction enzyme. Then the purple section, which is the TGA, that is the end codon. And the initial one, which is the green herald highlights, which is actually the signal peptide sequence that is introduced into the gene to enable the gene to be uh, translocated away from the cytoplasm so that it can be expressed extracellularly. Now, using the nucleotide sequence, the deduced amino acid sequence was obtained and a phylogenetic tree was constructed after blasting using a blast P on the NCBI data page, and which shows that the gene actually belongs to the cell A families of uh, bacillus like aliformis. Now, this is a wider search which is using the uh, deduced amino acid to blast all the um, bacillus uh, genus to understand where exactly it is uh, standing in. And this is so, it is very related to the bacillus like California DXMATTC or cellulase. Now, those multiple sequence alignments showing the arising section, which actually belongs to the signal peptide sequences of other bacillus. Uh, family. Now, hydrophobicity and hydropacity, which shows the amino acid sequence from 0 to 500. Actually, the amino acid is about 508 amino acids. So, which shows how they react in solvent. Now, the first area shows the deduced amino acid structure, the deduced protein structure using 3D model and um, using 3PZG as a model, which is actually belongs to the crystallized structure of uh, bacillus subsilis. Now, the, uh, the second part shows the amino acids using having a max part, which is actually the active sites, and the, uh, which is actually the binding sites, and also the active site. The third one is the, the Marachenda plot, which actually indicated that Amino acids of about 89.7% is actually residing in the most favorable region, while about 9.9% is residing in the non in the additionally allowed favorable region, and 0% is residing in non-allowed region. Now, here is a transmembrane analysis of A, the initial amino acid sequence, B, the genetically modified amino acid sequence, showing a thick bar, which is a transmembrane protein region, and the other side, which shows that it is not transmembrane, and it is extracellularly soluble protein. Now, using scoop uh, prediction two, we try to check the amino acid to know the thermostability. And interestingly, the melting temperature is around 71.2 uh, percent degree centigrade in the in silico uh, analysis. And why in the lab, the uh, enzyme has the optimum temperature of 70 degrees centigrade. So finally, using dry lab, the cloning process of 
cellulose gene was optimized for a better and easier extracellular expression. This has resulted in significant increments in the success rates of cloning and expression of extracellular proteins from gram-positive or eukaryotic cells in gram-negative medium. So finally, some of these uh, findings, vital findings has been validated by in vitro studies. I would like to thank uh, 54G for this platform, for, for providing the travel grants to come here and present part of our work. Thank you so much. All right, thank you very much. So we'll be taking like two minutes questions. So you have to, yeah. So we have some people raising up their hands. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Ogo Dole. Uh, good methodology, fantastic results. But then, what will your result achieve? And then, how will you bring it to, to life? Okay, thank you very much for that question. Now, the results is a process in which we circumvent some of the challenges we face in, the, in uh, production and purification of enzymes. Now, in the industry, like I earlier said, this enzyme is of great import importance, which means the industry needs more of this enzyme. Now, the natural way of doing this is when you clone, you express, you lyse your cell, like 50% of the cell is not functional, of the enzyme you produce is not functional. But with this, we have a higher yield of enzymes that are functional, which are expressed extra extracellularly. And this enzyme, when purified and utilized, they, are, they can be used for many, in many industries. Hi, thank you very much. I have a question. Um, before you move ahead to stabilize your protein, did you carry out any form of verification of your protein structure? And under your stability, um, the protein stability, what was the, like the result outcome? Was it a decrease in stability or an increase in stability? Thank you. If I get you right, um, did I carry out any 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 analysis to verify? your protein structure because you need to verify if the protein structure you have is actually valid. Yes, using ProCheck. Using ProCheck, we're able to verify that. Okay, the stability. Now, the stability is still normal compared to when it is done in, um, when the crude enzyme is being uh, purified. We're having the same stability. The difference is what I mentioned here, that uh, for the uh, computer, uh, computational analysis, we had about 712 but in the lab, what we had was 70 degrees centigrade, which is still 1.2 um, degrees in variation. And this enzyme actually is stable at 70 degrees for more than four hours. In the lab, computationally, using, um, using scoop uh, prediction two. So school position two will give some data that you will analyze to see the stability region within 40 degrees was the stability how many hours within 50 degrees how many hours and others thank you very much so i think one thing i just need to check is especially when you're doing computational studies it's always very good not to just use one uh tool because most of them use different algorithms and so they predict based on the algorithm so it's always advisable for example when you did uh structure validation 
you could actually use project saves and other ones and for the stability as well you, there are a lot of arrays of softwares i can actually use so with that you're very sure of the results you're getting because all of them use different algorithm otherwise a very nice presentation so ladies and gentlemen uh we'll be going for a tea break then afterwards then we'll be coming back for the evenings i mean for the afternoon session thank you you've been mostly kind yeah All right, yeah. So the tea break will be coming back by 12 minutes past 12 and uh, 10 minutes past 12. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Hello, please. If you have um, afternoon presentation, please uh, meet with the ICT to deposit your presentation.
You are welcome back from the tea break. So we'll be starting this afternoon session with oral presentations. If Ikena Maduako is ready, please can you indicate? Ikena Maduako. If you're presenting between 11 to 2, please can you indicate if you're in the house or online? On site, Muyiwa, Professor B. Muyiwa, are you ready? Ulumu, you will be presenting on identification and classification of malaria subtypes, biomarkers using deep cascade forest with gene expression. After. Okay. Toi Balogun, please get ready after Muiwa. You'll be replacing. Modibo. Toy Balogun, you'll be replacing Modibo after the first presenter. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Standing on the existing protocol, my name is Oluamira Fesobi, and I'll be presenting on the identification of malaria subtypes biomarker using deep forests. So biomarker is a measurable substance in the biological system as an indicator of exposure, effect, and susceptibility to a disease. And there are different types of biomarkers. Chemicals can be biomarkers, but in this context, we'll be looking at genetic biomarkers, which are coding genes, long and non-coding RNA, circular RNA, microRNA, and co. So um, according to Ishak and Vistra in 2020, they were able to analyze or highlight the most important effect of biomarkers, and which is to detect diseases early, therapy responses, and predicting outcome of clinical um, trials. So in this context, we're looking at malaria biomarkers. So, so far, there has been, I like, they've highlighted some um, gaps with malaria biomarkers, and some of it are lack of sensitivity, inability to differentiate between various subtypes of malaria. Then the antigen that has been used to currently develop the malaria um, detect 
RDTs we use currently can linger in the body for 28 days. So there's possibility that after you've been healed of the symptoms, you can still test negative, I mean, test positive to malaria. Then for deep forest, deep forest is um, a combination of assemble method and deep neural network. So it kind of uses, it leverages on the gaps between the neural network and random forest to provide an hybrid model that is that has a high level of performance. So the motivation of this study is that the antigens, as I said earlier, the antigens used for malaria RDTs can linger in the body for 28 days or more. And also deep forest has helped to leverage the gap between the neural network, the um, disadvantages of neural network and the advantages of random forest, but it has not been so far used on malaria data set. So the aim of this work is to study the aim of this work is to identify malaria biomarker subtypes from gene expression data using deep forest algorithm. And this aim is going, to be used, is going to be achieved by identification of the differentially expressed genes to be used as labels for the machine learning process. We will train and test and evaluate the deep forest model and also carry out a comparative analysis with six other machine learning algorithms. Then also we'll identify the biomarkers from the best performing models from the comparative analysis above. So this is a flowchart of how the research work went. So here are some of our results. For the differentially expressed genes, for the four different um, subtypes we're looking at, we're looking at the anemic malaria, uncomplicated, asymptomatic, and cerebral malaria. So out of all these, we had 276 differentially expressed genes for asymptomatic, 1,779 for cerebral malaria, 706 for uncomplicated, 372 for um, anemic malaria. But out of all those numbers, the ones on top are the ones that, had, that have the highest number. We ranked them using the log four chain in the analysis. So we had the most important top 10 genes highlighted there. Then after that, we had to check out which of those genes are kind of similar in all the subtypes. But we realized that so far, um, there are less similarity within those subtypes. So that shows that there's a need for us to specifically identify the different malaria types we have. So those differentially expressed genes in this analysis were used as labels for the machine learning. Then more features were added. So the first feature that we had for this um, study was that we had um, the expression values we had to summarize all the expression values and use it as a feature. Then more features were created using the PROTAR, the CODON W, the G profiler, and DIPLOC, and others on database, including string, to create more features for the gene list we had in this research. So um, our machine learning started, and we had to um, do a data split of 80 20 ratio with the data set. And so far, we realized that. Um, the deep forest, which is highlighted as a cascade forest there, had superior performance compared to all other algorithms used in these studies in terms of accuracy, in terms of AUC ROC too. Um, also, we also created a normal comparative study within the other six algorithms used. But this is a multi-class classification, so um, F1 score, recall, precision were not um, generated in this study. So. From the best performing model, which was the deep forest, we highlighted all the predicted genes and we created a network. And those networks were further analyzed to check out the most important orbs in those networks. So for the four different subtypes we were looking at in this study, different orb genes were identified using the M-code um, plugin. So we also carried out gene ontology analysis and CAG pathway analysis. But in the gene ontology pathway, we noticed that protein binding was the most um, congruent or the most important gene ontology in this study, and it was across all the subtypes. But for the keg pathway analysis, we realized that there are different pathways, but there's a little bit of pattern or there's a similar um, pathway that we identify in all the subtypes. So for the asymptomatic, we have leukocyte transendothelial migration, amebiasis, um, by secretion, Parkinson's disease, and vascular smooth muscle contraction. In the cerebral malaria, we realized that the major, um, the major cake pathway was the pathways in cancer, metabolic pathways. Also for um, the cake pathways for uncomplicated malaria, we have the protoglycans in cancer, 
the P13K AKT signaling pathways, the MAPK signaling pathway, Parkinson's disease, bowel secretion, and endometrial cancer. So we realize that there's a lot of similarity between malaria and cancer from this study. And this is not the first time it has been shown, but there are several literatures to, to identify and back up this research. For the keg pathway in anemic malaria, we had the metabolic pathway, the N-glycan biosynthesis, human papilloma virus infection, and the Yersinia infection. So to so just highlight some of the genes that were identified for the different um, malaria group, we had a little discussion here, which shows that the aptoglobin gene, HP, has been reported to as reported in uncomplicated malaria in children in Uganda. And if you check our previous chart where we had the top 10 genes, we can see HP gene there. Then also the APP gene was also identified in cerebral malaria. Then the resistin is found to be expressed in concordance with other set of genes, the LTF, OLFFM, CD117, CSGV, CAM, SP11, in animal induced with severe and cerebral malaria also. The same thing goes for lipokalin and S100 gene families. So in conclusion, this study was able to identify genes involved in various malaria subtypes computationally, and these genes add power experimental and computational validation backdrops in literature. Also, deep forest algorithm has been reported to show superior performance, and this was seen in this study. And um, this is the first time this kind of this model is applied to malaria data set. And this um, study was also able to validate the fact that deep forest outperform other machine learning algorithms. And this workflow can be applied to other neglected diseases plaguing Africa. Um, acknowledge me. I want to thank my supervisor, Dr. Jalili Oilade, and Dr. Itunu Shewon. Um, the director of Capricase, Combinat University, 54 Gene, and NBGN for this platform. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions, comments, and observations. Hello, Hello sir. You are with the mic. Yeah, thank you for so being my um, office mate. Yeah, just so people will know that it's, it's no, so that I declare that uh, you and I share. Yeah. Uh, so, your deep forest found used data of gene expression of, you know, from which is a response to malaria exposure, right? And, and when you analyzed it, you saw those cancer-related pathways, particularly endometrial cancer. Very interesting. So what I would tell you is that Dr. Dokuma and I, we have a paper that has been accepted waiting for payment that actually showed aptoglobin linked to breast cancer, even in Nigerian population. Uh, so I just wanted to give you also that information. Uh, Thank you, sir. Um, but it's not good that we share offices and we are just hearing about this here. I'm sorry about that, sir. Did you understand? Great job. Um, I, I, I like the study. Thank, Thank you very much, sir. Oh, Mr. Presenter, you have a wonderful job. I'm also into this aspect, but my concern is about the data sets. I'd like to know the amount of data and how you can um, provide probably a huge data set that will help to really classify your accuracy or your evaluation performance. Thank you so much. Um, about the data set, the data set were um, from African children within the age of zero to six. And okay, miracle. I'm concerned about the amount. Oh, the sample okay. side is what oh, okay. I'm concerned okay. about. Um, the sample side contained 19,000 plus genes okay. with over 60 features. Features, okay. okay. And those, um, the children were 18 children in all, 25 children in all. Okay. Yes. It's it's really small. Small. So, yes. because the higher the amount, then 
better the performance. Yes. And we want to extend this study to other diseases also, so we can get better performance. Thank you for your presentation. I just want to know if this um, research, the outcome of it, will lead to better control of malaria in children. Will it? Um, yes, sir. The major aim is to see if we can develop a new RODTs with specificity to all these um, types, the malaria subtypes, the anemic malaria. So instead of just going to the hospital and they tell you that, oh, you have malaria, they should be able to identify that, okay, this is anemic malaria, or this has progressed to cerebral malaria, or if it's just in the uncomplicated state. So this, there's further work that should be done in the biomedical aspects in developing those new RODTs, sir. Sorry, I came late. I'm just coming, but that response to that question asked me to uh, say this. You can, when it comes to clinical diagnosis, anemic or cerebral malaria, it, we can't totally rely on, uh, on this kind of study or assay. Because the two type, the two uh, diagnoses, it's a critical diagnosis, a critical stage. You can't wait until you, until you are say before you can say, okay, it is anemic. We have what we call clinical features, which comprise of symptoms and signs. If a child comes down with features of fever and the rest, pointing to malaria, uh, malaria, the pallor. Either in the eye, the tongue, or the palm, we will tell the clinician that it is anemic malaria. What, what, what is causing the anemia may be treated thereafter, but the anemia has to be addressed first. In case of cerebral malaria, you know, those child, they came in unconscious. Came in unconscious. So you, you need all that parameters to say, okay, it, the cerebral malaria, and uh, it involves more chemical, uh, chemistry, yes, chemistry, from the spinal cord, uh, spinal cord sample, to say it is cerebral malaria. I, I, I don't accept, I can't go with that. Thank you, sir. Even for the cerebral, it's best to use imaging techniques, because it has advanced into the brain, and you can't easily take samples from there. So if... Okay, I think I, I get your point, sir. So I think what this study can do, we can't throw this study out outrightly, but it can help in suppressing or quickly addressing um the progression into these two deadly stages. From what you're saying, it's just telling us that it's late already to use this kind of study. But if we can easily address it from the uncomplicated state to the severe state, then we can avoid um, the presentation of cerebral and anemic malaria. So I think it's, it works hand in hand. Thank you very much. Toi Balogun, please get set for your presentation. Announcement, please. If you are traveling in group, maybe to Lagos or Otakot by road, please, or Abuja, please see uh, Dr. Badamosi to arrange your transportation. All right. So Toyi Balogun will be presenting on computational evaluation of bioactive compounds from 
Colocasia Affinis as a model, as a novel EGFR inhibitor for cancer treatment. Computational evaluation of bioactive compounds from colocasia affinitiates. My name is uh, Toyi Badewale Balogun. Okay, good day everyone. My name is Balogun Toyib Adewale from the Department of Biochemistry at the Kunyajashi University, Akungba Akoko. Today, I will be presenting on the research topic titled Computational Evaluation of Bioactive, Comp Computational Evaluation of Bioactive Compounds from Colocasia Affinitiates as a Novel EGFR Inhibitor in Cancer Treatment. Here are the table of contents. Cancer, according to World Health Organization, cancer has been known to be the second leading cause of death worldwide and has accounted for approximately 9.6 million deaths worldwide. There are various forms of cancer. We have lung cancer, prostate cancer, breast cancer, and many others. Epidemic growth factor receptor. Oh, sorry. Epidermal growth factor receptor is a transmembrane protein which has been reported to be involved in the pathogenesis and pathophysiology of cancer. Thus, EGFR is a novel and therapeutic target in the treatment of cancer. Oh. Sorry, this is not showing properly, but uh, what do you show here? Okay. What this is showing here is a schematic representation of the EGFR signaling pathway. For uh, the EGFR to be activated, a growth factor will bind to its receptor, which is the uh, epidermal growth factor receptor. Once it binds, it leads to the activation of the receptor, which then causes dimerization. Once dimerization occurs, there will be autophosphorylation of the cysteine kinase residues of the receptor. When this happens, it will in turn then activate downstream signaling cascades, such as RAV, RAS, and other pathways, which then promotes a cancer cell proliferation. Okay, good. So this then promotes cancer cell proliferation. Overexpression and somatic mutations of EGFR has been found in various clinical uh, manifestations of cancer. Thus, there is a need to actually target this protein for cancer treatment. One of the effective treatments is the use of small molecules inhibitors that actually binds to the ATP binding sites of the uh, kinase domain. The objective, access to uh, most of these clinically approved and synthetic drugs is not very easy, particularly in developing countries due to unaffordability. And also most of these cancer cells are becoming fast resistant. That is, uh, there is drug resistance to all these clinically approved drugs. Thus, in this research, we are trying to uh, employ computational techniques to develop a novel drug candidate using, uh, from medicinal plants. The first uh, objective is to predict the ligand uh, receptor complex, binding energy, and as well, analyze the binding process. Also, we make use of density functional theory analysis, which is to determine the chemical reactivity of the compound and its electronic structure. Finally, we also evaluate the pharmacokinetic profile, which help us to determine are these compounds druggable or they are not druggable compounds. Here is the methodology. Here, we make use of uh, molecular docking, pharmacokinetics profile, and as well as density functional theory. To result and discussion, 
Here is the results. From the results, we make use of Jefitinib. Jefitinib is a, a clinically approved drug that has been used in treatment of cancer, and it works by binding to the ATP binding uh, sites of EGFR. Thus, we can also propose that this our compound follows the same uh, mechanism of action. From here, it can be seen that myricetin has the highest uh, binding affinity, followed by other compounds. To further uh, evaluate these, uh, their binding energy, we employed advanced molecular mechanism calculation, which helps to correct false positive results due to their uh, force field and other parameters, which are not involved in molecular docking. From here, it can be shown that myricetin, although it has the highest docking score, when it comes to the uh, advanced mechanism calculation, it shows a lower binding affinity when compared to rosmarinic acid. This can be said that uh, ros um, MMGBSA is very accurate and reliable and as well can produce a uh, reproducibility result when compared to the docking. This is the 3D uh, interaction profiling. Here, it shows the amino acids that are actually present at the binding sites of the uh, EGFR, which are responsible for stability and as well as interaction. The uh, bioactive compounds form various types of interaction. They form hydrophobic interaction, hydrogen bond interaction, pi cation. Some even form uh, salt uh, bridges. The essential amino acids that are actually available at the active sites of this uh of this protein are uh, methionine lysine phenylalanine and others and this can be said that the ligands actually interact with these uh uh with these amino acids so as to form stability this uh, as well the functional theory analysis we want to know how reactive these chemical compounds are can they actually easily donate electron and as well easily ac uh, accept an electron homo and lumo homo is the highest occupy molecular orbital which is electron rich and can easily donate an electron while lumo is the lowest occupied molecular orbital which can easily receive uh electron for a particular compound to be chemically reactive, it has to have a very high uh, OMO and a very low LUMO. From the results, it can be shown that our compounds from chemferol down to transferolic acid, it has a high OMO value and a lower LUMO value. This shows that the compounds are chemically reactive. Also, these are the optimized structure via the molecular modeling. And this shows that the molecules, the OMO and the LUMO actually spread throughout the molecule, uh, throughout the uh, molecules. And it's not being concentrated on a particular region. Furthermore, we want to assess, are these compounds actually druggable or they are not druggable compounds? According to Christopher Lipinski, he said for a compound to be druggable, it must not uh, violate more than two violations. And this rule was then proposed as the Lipinski rule of five. From the results, it can be shown that none of the compounds actually violated Lipinski rule of five, except myricetin, with only one violation, which is due to the hydrogen number of hydrogen bond donor. Actually, one violation is still very much acceptable in drug development. Thus, we can say these compounds are, are druggable compounds and can be explored further for the develop, uh, development of small, small molecules for cancer treatment. So uh, lastly, we want to look at the pharmacokinetic profile. That is, we want to simulate the physiological condition of these compounds. Then we, we look at some models, which are the uh, like biodegradation, carcinogenicity. We want to look, does these compounds actually have the potential of inducing cancer themselves? And we see that none of these compounds are actually carcinogenic. Also, we look at the effects on these cytochrome P450 superfamilies. And we see that most of the compounds do not have any effects on the cytochrome P450s. Uh, particularly, we look at the hepatotoxic effect of this compound. Though, disappointingly, we found that about three of the compounds actually are, are hepatotoxic. Nonetheless, the reference drug, Jefitinib, is also hepatotoxic. Thus, uh, during drug development cycle, we can actually subject some of uh, this compound to structural modification. When we subject them to structural modification, they will become a more druggable properties and uh, might not be able to actually have hepatotoxic uh, 
effects. We also look at other parameters like how these molecules can actually bind to the human uh, protein binding and others. So in conclusion, in this research, we have been able to identify uh, promising EGFR inhibitor for EGFR, EGFR targeted therapy for cancer treatment. Although this is a computational study, further laboratory studies such as uh, in vitro or in vivo are still required to evaluate the pharmacological and biological properties of this uh, compound. I would like to acknowledge 54 Jean for providing the uh, for providing the travel fellowship to um, attend this conference and Nigeria Bioinformatics and Genomics Network for organizing such uh, an amazing conference. Thank you for listening. Questions, observations, and comments, please. Yeah, thank you very much for that nice presentation. Yes, my question borders around your calculation of MMGBS. If you could just flip to the slide. All right, so while you were flipping there, I think what is very important is you didn't really state the, uh, the units of your MMGBS. Is in kilocalorie per mole or kilojoule per mole? I think it's very important for you to put it there. Oh, yeah. So, and how did you calculate it? Yeah. So, and again, when you were talking about uh, interaction about uh, the active site molecule and then the your 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 compound, uh, using that as that would not be that very exhaustive because when you I think you just did only molecular docking which just shows instantaneous uh, binding or interaction between your drug, I mean your compound in this case, and the active site molecule. So you would discover that, and that would might not really give you a total idea of what is really happening inside because that is instantaneous. When you do like a simulation by a period of time, you would notice that those bonds might actually be temporary. Maybe after 10 nanoseconds, 20 nanoseconds, you see that you're losing quite a lot of a bond and it might actually not actually be this interaction at the end of maybe get to like 300 nanoseconds, these bonds may have been, you have been different bonds. So what I'll just say is to take this further, you may actually consider doing some more exploratory studies like molecular dynamic simulation. With that, you can actually calculate the, uh, the uh, root mean squared deviation, the stability of the compound. So you can do quite a lot of exploratory study. And the last thing in your conclusion, it said, uh, we have been able to identify selective inhibitor of EGFR. I think that statement is overreaching because how would you be able to stay? What it can be totally sure that it's actually selective to EGFR. It could actually be targeting other uh, other other protein targets, right? Which might even lead to uh, like what we call off-target effects, which might be even leading to toxicity of those compounds. And again, yeah, I think that's just all. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. To answer the question, uh, I will start with the MMGPSC. Actually, um, the MMGPSC, the unit is in kilocal per mole. And how we calculate it is we make use of um, Strodinger software. So it's a computed, uh, um, like a computer software. It is automated. So we input the queries and it actually generates the results for us. Yes? Entropy? No, 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 no. We didn't make use of it. Oh, all right. Then, um, okay, then at the active sites, although there has been some work that we published, uh, for example, we just published some of the work like uh, under receptor tyrosine kinases, targeting, uh, targeting HER2 uh, receptor. We did a simulation for about 100 nanoseconds. But for the sake of this work, we could not be, due to fund, uh, fund on avail uh, availability, we were not, uh, we not able to like further the work more for simulation, but we hope to further do simulation, at least to improve the quality of the work. Thank you very much. I want to commend you. I'm impressed. Uh, that's a good one. Uh, and also I'm happy that uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, this work, you are not completing it until maybe you do further work, you subject it to other analysis. But then I want to ask you, how did you identify the plant that is number one? 
Did you do authentication? And then for your further work, which part of this plant will you use? Will you use the leaf, the root, or the stem, or fruit? Which part? Thank you very much, sir. Actually, for the research, we try to find uh, numerous uh, medicinal plants and we screen the libraries of these plants. How we identify this plant is through literature search and literature review. From literature review, we found out that there has been a laboratory work that has been done on the uh, manuscripts using these plants. Then there is a library, uh, uh, the research using the plants actually make use of the leaf. They extract the phytochemicals and characterize it using high performance liquid chromatography. After the characterization, they then report the uh, exact uh, bioactive compounds in the manuscripts. It is from there we now extracted our own uh, ligands. We get the name from there, then go to our uh, PopChem, which is a database that actually contains all the ligands. We uh, went there, we then download the uh, chemical structure, which is the 2D of these compounds. After downloading them, then we prepare them for molecular docking. That is what we do, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for that uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, we all understand that the ligand receptor interaction oftentimes um, leads to the activation of signaling events. So uh, how are you, were you able to kind of monitor that, okay, this particular signaling event does not really, or uh, doing in vivo studies will not lead or result in the activation of other signaling pathways that will lead to the expression activation of another maybe cancer types. Okay, there is the thing. Uh, EGFR is a receptor tyrosine kinases, and it is not being found in a particular cancer. It has been found in various forms of cancer, particularly even in lung cancer, thyroid cancer, and pancreatic cancer. So it's overexpression. It means when there is uh, a cancer, we can actually use these inhibitors, the EGFR inhibitors, to stop the cancer at the early stage. So if we are working with the cancer, then that means we are trying to work along every uh, cancer, except we want to narrow down our research so a particular cancer, maybe uh, the one that has been most studied with the EGFR, which is the uh, lung cancer, then with that, we can now make use of a drug that we have known that this can actually induce cancer, such as using streptotocin to induce diabetes. So we can actually use that to induce cancer. So with that, we know that, oh, we've induced lung cancer and we are working with lung cancer. Thank you, sir. Uh, the last question. Yes, thank you very much for that presentation. So, uh, you just mentioned that you've worked with uh, other EGFR inhibitors, and I think you already know that the reason why they are not working yet is because of some mutations that are due to the drugs. So, do you already anticipate such a scenario in case you come through with this? And how will you deal with that? Sorry, is the question about uh, how to deal with mutations that actually yes, occur? Yes, because, because you're intending to use the drug for treatment of cancer. Yes. And there are people who have already targeted the tyrosine kinase inhibitors for EGFR, and it hasn't worked yet okay. because of that. So don't you think you're going to hit the same uh, snap down the road? Or if you already anticipate it, what will you do about it? Okay. Yes. I think one thing about cancer, or the reason why it's a life-threatening disease is because can cancer actually have uh, various uh, multiple signaling pathways. And that's why it is, has been very difficult to treat cancer. One of the best ways to treat cancer is uh, through what they call polypharmacology, where uh, you are using a particular drug to target multiple pathways. I think that that's like an emerging field of pharmacology, also known as this network pharmacology, where we are trying to like explore a particular compound and be using it to target multiple compounds. With that, we can know, okay, if this particular compound did not make use of EGFR uh, cascade, at least it's going to make use of uh, maybe the vascular endothelial growth factor. If it doesn't make use of that, it can tend towards like insulin receptor that has also been linked to cancer pathogenesis. It can, it can also explore that, or as well, it can make use of all these different kinases. Thank you. 
please can we appreciate him announcement please if you're planning to travel to Oshogbo tomorrow by 7 a.m please kindly see dr mrs adewale to get a space right now i'll be inviting dr shore Mekun. Thank you very much, sir. So the next presenter is uh, Ikena Maduaku Ivizie. Ikena Maduaku, or if he's online. Okay, so if Ikena Maduaku is not here, can we have uh, Sharon Akinpelu? Yeah. So Sharon Akikpelu will be presenting characterization of the cold gut microbiome of Nigerian collateral cancer patients. Please, all the travel fellowship awardees, I sent the people who have full fellowships, I sent an email. I need an urgent response. Please quickly check your mail and respond to it urgently. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sharon Akinkwelu, and I'll be presenting on characterization of the gut microbiome of Nigerian colorectal cancer patients. My presentation will be guided by this outline, beginning with the introduction. Colorectal cancer is the third most common malignancy worldwide and is the most common type of gastrointestinal cancer in Nigeria. Cases and mortality are increasing in Nigeria and in sub-Saharan Africa with many Nigerian patients presenting at hospitals at the later stages of the disease. Important risk factors in colorectal cancer development include diet, which is basically a shift to the high fat, high protein diet found in westernized nations, age, alcohol consumption, smoking, and fiscal inactivity. Many studies have reported that the gut microbiome is important to maintain intestinal health, and it has been implicated in many diseases. The gut microbiota um, refers to the community of microorganisms present in the gut. They consist of bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and viruses. There are about 100 trillion cells, and they perform many functions, such as metabolism, where, for example, they ferment non-digestible carbohydrates into short-chain fatty acids, which are beneficial to humans. They also are important in defense. Some of these microorganisms produce antimicrobial substances, which prevents the colonization of pathogens. The gut microbiome, due to the advent of high throughput sequencing, the gut microbiome has been connected to many diseases, such as type 2 diabetes and many types of cancers. Imbalance in this microbial community, known as dysbiosis, has been reported in patients with colorectal cancer. Some of the bacteria that have been associated with colorectal cancer include Fusobacterium nucleatum, Peptostreptococcus, Enterococcus fecalis, and Porphyromonas. These bacteria are found to be enriched in colorectal cancer patients, and they may contribute to development of this disease by producing toxic metabolites. For example, Fusobacterium nucleatum produces hydrogen sulfide from the uh, fermentation of proteins, and it's a carcinogen. They also modulate the immune response. Some of these bacteria activate pro-inflammatory pathways. Very few studies have been carried out in Nigeria characterizing the gut microbiome. So the aim of this study is to characterize the gut microbiome of Nigerian colorectal cancer patients and compare the results with healthy individuals. This will be done by isolating and characterizing the bacteria from human stool samples in Nigeria, determining the antimicrobial susceptibility of isolates to commonly use antibiotics and characterizing the composition of the gut microbiome using 16S RNA sequencing. This study will be guided by this methodology beginning with sample collection. Stool samples will be obtained from colorectal cancer patients and healthy subjects. The patients will be recruited from Lagos State University Chin Hospital Ikeja and Federal Medical Center Abe Okuta. Stool samples will be con um, collected in sterile tubes and transported to the laboratory for analysis. Demographic information of the study subjects, such as age, sex, and family history of colorectal cancer, will be collected from them using structured questionnaires. 
This will be followed by isolation and characterization. These two samples will be cultured on solid media, including the man Rugusa and Sharp Ega for Lactobacillus, Maconkey Ega for Enterobacteriaceae, and Blood Ega. They will be characterized using gram stain and based on biochemical reactions. When um, pure cultures would be uh, test the sensitivity of pure cultures will be tested to antibiotics, commonly used antibiotics using Kebibar, this diffusion technique. So the total bacterial DNA from two samples will be extracted from, will be extracted using the QIAMP DNA stool kit following the manufacturer's protocol. And um, sequencing of the V3 to V4 hypervariable region of the 16S RNA gene will be carried out using the following primers. The sequencing data will be processed using bioinformatic pipelines and T-tests will be performed to evaluate significant differences between in the phylogenetic diversity and species richness between healthy individuals and colorectal cancer patients. Expected contributions to knowledge. The objective of this study is to characterize the gut microbiome of colorectal cancer patients and to be compared with that of healthy individuals. The results will also be compared with gut microbiome profiles obtained from studies done in developed nations to see if there are differences due to geographic location. The gut microbiome profiles of colorectal cancer patients may also be useful as non-invasive diagnostic biomarkers for colorectal cancer. I would like to acknowledge 54 Gene and the Nigerian Bioinformatics and Genomics Network for the opportunity to present at this conference. Thank you. So do we have any questions? We have two minutes for questions. Okay. Okay, looking at the plan, it's quite an interesting study, but I have a, a small worry. Maybe it might just be an omission. I didn't get anything about ethical consideration, considering the fact that you're dealing with humans. An omission. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, so instead of you are a microbiologist, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, and I understand why. I mean, and I and I say this to a lot of my microbiology friends. I know it's, it's like part of your culture tradition to do the culturing and all of those things. Um, if you don't do it, you've not. And I, I get that. Now the question is, why don't you just go straight and do metagenomic analysis? Yeah, because now. It's a, you see, when we're doing genomic studies, it's short in the dark. You don't know what you're going to get. I'm just wondering, um, is it just, is there any reason? Uh, and I, would you consider, you know, doing, you know, meta genomics if you have the opportunity, or is it against the tradition of, of whatever? No, it's not against the tradition. If there's opportunity to go straight to meta genomics, then I can do that. Okay. Um, thank you for your presentation. I think it's like a no that you must know the organism you are, you're working with. You must first of all isolate in microbiology. You must first of all isolate, identify, or better off characterize. So you identify either by chemically to know, you know, to, as in, to make sure that this is the organism. For instance, if you isolate staff, okay, how am I showing staff? I'm going to view the biochemically, and I see the structure, I know, okay, this is staff. Then whichever process, uh, process or any other part that you're interested in, you can then further it. So you don't just jump in. So there must be a protocol to follow, especially microbiology, thank you. Thank you.
yes uh thank you i think that will be all for sharon so dr lanio can come out okay, okay yeah, yeah yeah they said they have some questions on zoom let me just share Okay, our next presenter will be Dr. Jacob Popola. He'll be presenting on the Chloroplast gene sequence relate, re relatedness and genetic variation among some African yam beans. Dr. Jacob Okola. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jacob Popola, and I'm pleased to present to you uh, this research titled The Chloroplast RBCR Gene Sequence Relatedness and Genetic Variation Among Some African Young Beings, Sphenostylis Tenocava Assertions. You will ask me, what is African Young Being? African Young Being. It's a leguminous crop that produces two products, the tuber and the seed. And both of them, they are very nutritious and at the same time contain phytochemicals, metabolites, minerals, and so on and so forth. Very, very rich in protein. Among other mainstream legumes like soybean, Cowpea, Figna, Logriculata, African yam bean has more protein than these mainstream legumes. Now, the RBCR gene. RBS gene is a barcode DNA for plant species and very, very effective in phylogenetic studies. At the family level, it is used to differentiate and to distinguish and also for taxonomic studies. The African young being has so many constraints, some of which include the hardness of the seed, and that makes it somehow difficult to cook. It takes time to cook because of the hard seed coat. Apart from that, there are some anti-nutritional content of AYB. It has some anti-nutritional content. In addition to this, there is no detailed sequence information available on African young bee, and that has actually slowed down the genomic manipulation of African young bee to somehow manipulate some of those constraints to make it more viable, even uh, for farmers and for hemp users. Now, the objective of this study is to determine the, the degree of genetic relatedness and diversity among 20 genotypes, that is 20 accessions of African young being using the RBCR gene marker. To do this, to do this, we collected a total of 20 genotypes from RITA Genetic Resources Center. And after that, we planted, and um, after two weeks, 
of planting, we harvested the leaves and then subjected that leaves to DNA extraction using Simon kit. Then after the extraction, we carry out the RBC primer and amplification using the forward and reverse primers of the RBC gene. Then the DNA sequencing reaction using the genetic analyzer. Afterward, we carry out the identification of ARB association sequences and then other analysis. In doing that, we use bioedit and genius prime to achieve um, this part. The sequences were first of all cleaned, and at the same time, we carry out the alignment using bioedit. After the alignment, we now, we now try to identify all that gene sequence in the Fabiese family to look at their relatedness. Now, we pick the TSS1 having a unique sequence as our ancestral accession. And now, first of all, compare with available sequence of African Yambi, that is Phenostylis Stenocarpa, on the NCBI database. And then we discovered that this TSS1 is having 98.01 sequence similarity with the AYB available at the NCBI database with query cover of 99%. Likewise, the aligned sequence is also having genetic relationship with other members of Fabiese family to which African Yambi, that is Phenostylis tenocapa, belongs. It's having relationship. It's having relationship with them. For example, Fasciolus fulgaris, which is having sequence similarity of 97.30 sequence similarity. Also, for Socapos tetragonobolos, that is wing bean, is also having uh, 95 for point, for point four three. Now, our heart group is a polygala charmibos. The reason why we picked as a heart group is the only one that is that produces tuba with African yambi. That is the only uh, members of Fabiese family that produces tuba. We now compare it with those of them that also produces tuba among the African Yambi association. And that is having about sequence similarity of 92.87. Now, our figure two shows the neighbor joining relationship amongst them. We segregated the 20 associations into two major clays. Now, in the first clays, you will see that most of them, they are standing alone, except TSS2 and TSS3, that is having the kind of 100% similarity. And that shows that it's most likely that both of them, they are from the same ancestry. They have similar ancestry. And however, uh, we have TSS24 and then TSS5 that are standing alone in clade one. While in clade two, we only have just one accession. We have one accession that is standing alone, and that is TSS 84. Other accessions, they are also unique in their home. Now, the conclusion from this work is that despite the fact that there's a kind of high genetic similarities among these 20 accessions of African young being, there's still also existence of considerable genetic variations due to the detection of SMPs as a, as a result of an exchange of one base to another, in which case we can have some trans transitional that is purine, uh, replacing another purine, and then transfusional, purine, and then pyrimidine. Then the similarity of RBC sequence of AIB to some other legumes indicate their proximity, and that confirm being together in the same family of Fabiese. Now, in this study, we identify six accessions from our 20 accessions, six of them, TSS5, TSS7, TSS14, TSS24, TSS51, and TSS84. 
84, which can be adopted as parental lines. One for heterosis crossing, in which case to generate better variant. And at the same time, for marker assisted breeding, even though most of hybridization work that have been carried out about HYB does not be one that is, there's no success story so far. But then we believe that using some of these assertions, that is the six of them, as parental assertion, it will head uh, in the production of uh, better marker also for AYB and uh, for marker assisted breeding of better variant varieties of AYB. Finally, the RBC is a coding region and it's a consult region. And that, that is so efficient to recognize SMPs among samples of closely related species, even among the same species as we considered in this study. Thank you. And uh, I would like to appreciate 54 Gene for Travel Fellowship and also the genetic resources of IATA for producing, for giving us the 2020 assessment of African Yambi to carry out this study. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Question, comments, and observations. Thank you so much for this uh, presentation, sir. Um, my question is that considering the hard coat nature of the AYB, did you carry out any form of seed treatment before planting? If yes, do you think if it is chemical, it will affect the genetic composition? Thank you. Thank you so much. And there's no need to carry out any pretreatment for planting. The only thing you can use to hate germination is to carry out what is known as scarification. And scarification is like you are creating a wound around the seed so as to enhance the germination process. So there's no need to do that. In less than seven days, AYB can germinate and then you can get your leaf sample. We actually use the leaf from the planted seed. So there's no need for any pretreatment for that since we are not looking at uh, uh, maybe the food processing or whatever. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I don't know. The, the outcome of your experiment, does he intend to address the problems that uh, AYB farmers have been having. I deal with them directly as a, a researcher. The problem is the issue of the cooking time to the anti-nutrients. Yeah. Does this actually address the problem at hand? Because the other person was talking about the hard coat, yeah. but that is before planting, which yeah. scarification could address. Yeah. So uh, how does it solve a farmer's problem now? Thank you, thank you so much. Our hand goal is also farmers and the consumers. But then you need to first of all look at the basics before you go to the final outcome. And that is why we are first of all trying to generate sequences that also aid in the whole chloroplast sequencing of AYB. If you check as I'm talking now, there is no whole genome sequence on HYB. Neither do you have it also for whole chloroplast genome of AYB. Now, what you can find are some of uh, maybe scanty, uh, scanty sequences that are available that we submitted to the Gene Bank of NCB High and um, some, of our, some other fellows that also submitted sequences. Now, the idea of this is to pull all this together and also assemble a kind of a uh, old genome sequence of AIB, which later in the future will address some of this problem. By the time we have it, it will be able to, 
a scientist will be able to now manipulate the genome of AYB, identify the genes that are responsible for at seed coat, and then for long cooking hour. When, they are the, when we identify this type of genes, be able to do a kind of mapping and then come out with a solution to, uh, to the at seed coat. This, I think, the way we can go. Thank you very much, sir. I will be linking my question to the last question concerning the ad seed code. And uh, from my own inference, I see that uh, it has been genetically established that the ad seed code um, is, I mean, is, is linked with the genome of, of the, the seed. So I believe that the, the problem is not only a, a, um, a farmer's problem, it's also a consumer's problem. Yeah. Because it's, it has an economic importance, kind yeah. of. So my, my, my own question is kind of uh, from the consumer's perspective. What do you think about the fact that uh, many a times people bought, sorry, soaks the beans in modern Nigeria now? I, was not, I didn't know of that sense very well I was little. But in modern Nigeria now, I learned that people soak the beans for some minutes. For overnight? I don't know, maybe overnight, I don't know. Really, did they do that overnight? I, th I thought it was just one or two hours before they cook it. So what do you think? Do you think it affects the nutritional value of heat? And uh, what's the effect of that uh, on the, the nutritional content of, of this uh, produce? Thank you. Well, I agree with you that they do carry out soaking for like one or two hours before cooking. But then, personally, I don't really support that. I don't really support, uh, maybe you soak the beans for some time. And the possibility in the process of soaking, certain elements or minerals might gas out of, of it. So I don't really support that. But then, as you said, the, the genome work, what I've read so far, is also target, targeting the end users. Now, before they do any genomic manipulation, they will have carried out uh, the process of a gene expression, gene structure, and all that, to understand how those genes behave. They will have studied that. And uh, if they do that, be able to now identify what type of gene, how can that gene be expressed, how can it, uh, the, the, the structure of that gene, what will be the end result of that gene before they do a kind of incorporation. So I think uh, I don't really, Personally, I don't support soaking. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. So announcement, please. For the evening session, Dr. Mrs. Oladele and Dr. Chinwe will be serving as chair and co-chair. Chineye, Dr. Mrs. Oladele and Dr. Chineye will serve as the chair and the co-chair. Now, for the transport uh, logistics, we have um, Calabar 1, uh, Ore 4, Abuja 4, Iloring 3, Akure 3, Lagos 0, Oshogo 0. So if you are still interested in um, going by road, 7 a.m. tomorrow, please, uh, Ibadan 0. So see Dr. Badamosi for the arrangement. Thank you. Lunch will be ready by two. If you want to go to the venue, you can go, but it will be served by two. Thank you very much. <laughs>